How's it going, everybody? Dave Meltzer here for the next two hours. We're going to be talking pro wrestling. We've got Brian Alvarez here, so it's uh, going to be taking your emails and phone calls, talking about last night's wrestling, the current wrestling scene, and uh, lots of emails about Raw last night. And we're going to start talking about the angle of Vince McMahon and Trish Stratus before we get into quality of matches and things on the other shows and Lex Luger's performance and all the other things we're going to get to before this segment is over. Um, Brian, what are your thoughts? When that segment was over with Vince McMahon and Trish Stratus, I swear to you, I thought that Vince McMahon was really going crazy. I really thought he was. I thought, like, this whole XFL thing has just driven this man, like, literally insane. And here he is on national TV um, expressing it, I guess. I think he's, uh, I don't know. It was just, I couldn't even believe what I was watching. It was like, I was thinking all the times that Vince McMahon has ever, uh, I guess, been snubbed by a woman, and uh, every single time that... Not, uh, not, not only him, but those 15,000 people in the audience. Oh, yeah. All the guys in the <laughs> audience that cannot get a woman. Uh, they were there in full force last night. Well, may, okay, okay, let's, let's not be mean. They may be able to get a woman, but they've also been snubbed by a woman at some point in their life. Which yeah. pretty much actually means everyone, but... I guess so. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I know the... the the whole game they were tugging at, it was really odd. There were a couple things that were obvious about what they were doing. But anyway, I don't mean to interrupt, even though I always do. No, go ahead. But uh, <laughs> And everyone that has ever uh, quit the WWF and asked to come back, Vince, <laughs> Vince got his revenge on everybody last night. and uh, Yeah, but the ratings came in today, so it didn't matter. Made himself a uh, total goof in the process. Uh, that was a very risky thing to do because... I'll tell you what, if NBC, if any, like, executive from NBC just happened to be, like, watching TV on Monday and not watching NBC and was just kind of switching around and all of a sudden it's, you know, 10 o'clock and they're going, hey, you know, this is somebody who we own, you know, 3% of their company and this is their flagship TV show. Let's sit there. They'd be going like, oh, my God, we already have the lowest rated regular show on, tele on, on, on the lowest rated show in the history of our network. And this is the guy that's our business partner, even though this is an act. He wrote this. Yeah. I was involved in the writing of this. This is like, it was quite bizarre. I was thankful that some people, because it, you know, airs here on three hour delay. And, um, I always watch Raw, even though I have a satellite, I watch Nitro. I watch Nitro live and then I watch Raw on the West Coast feed. So I had gotten several phone calls before that aired and I was just thankful I got them because if I had been watching that show with anyone else, uh, there would have been I mean, I don't even want to have to try to explain it. I, I, I don't defend it, but, you know, but I still have to explain it. You know, and the explanation is, well, the reason is because, see, Vince McMahon is, is this psychological thing with Vince McMahon because the football ratings are down, and they're just going to go like, yeah, right, he's just a sick dude. And, and then, you know, the thing, well, you know, he's teasing all those fans, so they'll buy Playboy down the, down the line when, uh, because they're never going to get see Trish Stratus strip without actually paying money for it, so they're setting up like a big Playboy, and it's just like it's just. A, but you say that to a, a, a person who's not a wrestling fan, a normal person, and they're like a normal person who's not a wrestling fan or not a fan of um, the the economics of teasing and delivering in the porn industry and in the wrestling industry, and you know that bark like a, that was some that was some very um, weird, uncomfortable stuff to watch, and yes, probably. Now, Brian, have you gotten the ratings? Because I have not gotten the ratings today. Yeah, the all of them are. Are... Um, I got the XFL numbers. I didn't get. I didn't get the. Uh, I mean, I, I I didn't get the wrestling ratings. Okay, basically, Raw did a four five. Nitro did a two one. The Raw show opened at a three six. Uh, pretty much was uh, fours throughout the rest of the show. I don't think there was like a big peak. I don't have them here in front of me. But so I don't what, know did, what, what did the, what did you don't know, you don't know what that strip like quarter? Because I expected that quarter. No, to but I think it was in the fours, like everything else. It wasn't like this huge. There wasn't like a then huge that's, jump that's, or anything like that. Because they were they were uh, they were putting that on to get a six, you know. Well, they didn't. Uh, the highest the they got was a five six for the final quarter, and then the overrun dropped all the way down to a five. They dropped for the main event from a five six to a five. They dropped for the overrun. Yeah, but the main event was completely overrun. Yeah, so they I dropped. Mean, the, the that is that is weird. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to explain it. Nitro was uh, low twos for the first hour. You'll love this part. When the what fake the Dusty what, what, came out... What was the first hour at, for, for total? 2-3? Two, like a 2-2, two, 2-3. Two, two, okay, well, that's what it's been. 
Uh, yeah, the first hour averaged uh, two three. Okay, so that's what's been doing most weeks. Uh, fake Dusty came out. It hit a two six right before the top mm -hmm. of the hour, and then after the top of the hour, when the real Dusty came out, dropped down to a two one. Well, that's Dusty was a one shot deal. And unfortunately, just, even worse a, than that. Dusty, Dusty came out. You know, Dusty came out. The real Dusty came out like thirty seconds before the hour break, and that was the timing of it. You know, right when people are about to switch, all of a sudden you see the real Dusty there, and you try to save the quarter. Now, the negative of it is those guys were, aside from the fact that was a real bad skit, they were stretching and stretching, trying to get, you know, as much into that quarter. And I think they ran a steam about, it was about seven or nine minutes in, so they didn't get the whole quarter, you know, keeping Flair and Dusty out there. Yeah. And that, and, and I think everyone knew that when Flair and Dusty were done, people were going to switch to Raw. Well, so. they did. It went from a 2-1 to a 1-6 for the Cruiserweight match. Oh, God. And stayed 1-6 the rest of the show until the final quarter, which did a 1-9. Well, not, not a lot of good news. Um, uh, the XFL numbers were not good news either. It was 2-4 for NBC, which was not the all-time record. Uh, lowest, because the, the there was a hockey game once that did a 2-3, which we later found, which we found out about, which I didn't know about a week ago. But the final hour from 10 to 11 did set a record for the lowest rated hour Ever in prime time, the final hour of that Saturday Night Football game did a 1-9. Oh, my God. And the previous half-hour low record was, I'm, actually, I don't know what it was. It was thought to be a 2-4, but I guess it's probably a little lower than that. But but the 1-9 is an all-time record for an hour, which, you know, the Ventura-Tillman feud as, was, was, was dead on arrival. Uh, actually, we can talk about the XFL in general. Um, then uh, the UPN game did a 1-2. And the TNN game, I believe, did an 09 on TNN, which would mean an 07 nationally, which means it did a 4-3 for the combined thing, which is actually, they actually dropped another 10% from last week. I didn't think they could drop much more. When is the point when it cannot drop any farther? What do you think? Zero? Well, absolute, absolute zero is, is the point. I mean, they've already, you know, 3.0 was the NBC point, where, you know, you figured that's the bottom. Yeah. Right? I mean, and, and it dropped below that. It's well below that now. Who would have ever thought you could do a 1-2 on UPN? I mean, they were expecting, what was that preseason thing? 3.0 was, was there, was there, cause it was, it was 5-5, five, 3-0, five, oh, and 2-5 was how they were expecting to deliver their 11. I think so I'm most surprised with NBC. I really, I, I think I could have predicted the low UPN and TNN. I don't think I would have ever predict that, that low? This low on that NBC. low? I mean, I, I, no, I, I knew TNN was not about to do a 2.5 every week. Mm -hmm. Now, now in 07, 09, uh, I thought maybe they... Well, maybe not, though, because Arena Football didn't do that well on CNN either. In fact, it's a lot worse. But um, the UPN number surprised me a lot. Mm -hmm. you know, a one two, I never thought they would get that low. I mean, I thought a three zero, they weren't going to get, but I thought, you know, they could keep it, too. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. Let's, let's go back to... We haven't uh, talked about uh, Linda yet, have we? Okay. Let's talk about Linda. Her comment. Linda was at uh, the Bear Stearns. Uh, annual uh, investment meeting, and they asked her about the XFL, and she said that they're committed to it throughout for the rest of the season, and then said something, and I don't have the quote in front of me. I so wish I did. That's why I had you say it. Okay, well, it was something to the effect of, uh, we have to examine the viability of the product in the current marketplace. Yep. Which I thought was a very ominous quote. I think the fact that they even mentioned it, Means the decision has already been made, and it's dead. Oh, I think it's. I think. I think the fact that they're doing the cheerleader thing means now they're just trying to like joke their way through it. I'm yeah, just save, amazed. Save the season. Well, I guess you can't save. The no, season. you're not going to save the season. Survive just, the season, maybe. They're not even. You know, well, they're going to survive. You know that they're. Um, they're going to lose a lot more money this year than WCW lost last year. I mean, a lot more. Mm hmm I mean, as far as XFL as as an enterprise, which when we all talk about how bad WCW is doing. Uh, just think about that one. And they don't have any uh, Hulk Hogan and Kevin Nash salaries to, uh, you know, add up to that debt. I mean, their 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 debt is adding up the hard way, you yeah. know, with, with low salaries. Yep. With all those $45,000 a year, guys. Which actually brings us to the poll on the website yesterday, which was the prediction of the fans for the future of the XFL. They won't even finish the season 6.4%. They'll fold after the end of the season, 49.3%. They'll play one more season, 34.8%. And I seriously need to know who these people are, but they will continue playing for years to come, 9.5%. Oh, 
I'm really surprised that even 34% think that they're going to do next year. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, they may, but I'm, I'm surprised. On uh, this web poll, uh, the poll on, on the IATA site, what do you think will be the number two sports entertainment group in the United States one year from today? WCW, 52%. Which wow. means that people think that uh, means half the people think they're going to be around in a year. Twenty three percent say UFC, two percent say Pride, six percent say another foreign company like New Japan or AAA, and seventeen percent say a new startup company. Uh, today's poll is on Monday Night's Wrestling. Which show did you think was better? A Raw was better. B Nitro was better. C didn't watch Raw. D didn't watch Nitro. E didn't watch Raw or Nitro. Uh, we should probably talk more about Raw. I thought, um, well, Paul Heyman was the announcer. They mentioned Jerry Lawler's name. Um, there's already a flood of people who now think that it's all a work. And I don't, I don't know. I cannot. This is not like the Bret Hart thing where I can tell you what it is because I know. I, I mean, I've talked to everyone involved. Um, how can I say this? I don't trust them implicitly. <laughs> Actually, one of the people, one of the people who would know, I do trust. I really do trust. So I think it probably isn't a work. Uh, but if Jerry Lawler shows up at WrestleMania and it's an angle, then yeah, then it's an angle. Uh, if he shows up on WCW television, I guess that's the key that it's for sure not a work. And what if it just so, worked out between now and WrestleMania and it was real? It's a it's a possibility, but no one will believe it. Yeah, it's true. Um, I mean, everyone thinks that the whole thing was a setup that they knew ahead of time because Heyman showed up. I think that may be the case. That may be the case, or may not be the case. Yeah. Um, Heyman was on. What do you think of Heyman? I thought he was pretty good. Did you? Yeah. I, I thought he was okay. I mean, I was... anything's going to be a step down from Lawler, but, you know, I was just sitting there going, um, this could be Michael Cole, uh, this could be Kevin Kelly, uh, this could be Jonathan Coachman, but it's Paul Heyman, so I was happy. I thought he was okay. Um, I didn't expect him to be, you know, Lawler. I think he got a little bit better as the show went on. He's trying to feel his way. There's no lock that he's going to be doing this permanently, although if they ask him to, he is. So I guess, yeah. you know, they only asked him to do it for one week. Taz is doing the show tonight with Michael Cole, the SmackDown. Um, overall, I mean, I don't know about the whole Lawler thing as far as why they mentioned it, but I don't think well, I... That it was a coincidence that they made all the uh, mentions of ECW. Just throughout the show, up and oh, down, no, 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 no. wearing the no, no. ECW hat when he was doing commentary, even though he was oh, wearing a hat, but in ECW one something. in particular. Yeah, they're going to do something. Yeah. Although, if that's the case, uh, why did they go to Rhino and, and go, uh, can you come up with a new name because we don't like the name? Because yeah. they were going to do that. Well, maybe that was their that... decision that they made before they knew this was going to happen. Good point. Because they asked Rhino about the new name a week ago, although I haven't heard of anyone saying, hey, we changed our, well... Because I'm sure everybody assumed that he was going to come in, but it's not like anybody knew when it was going to be. I mean, it's not like they're going to hold Rhino off until they know Heyman's coming in, because, you know, who knows how long that could be. Yeah. So, well, they could do something. The problem is, is that it's, you know, you you got to be satisfied with the fact that this interpromotional feud will be for, you know, the you know, mid Carters. Guys. Yeah. I, mean, I don't even need the mid Carters. I think it's for all those guys that don't have a program, you know, your Billy Guns and Alberts, Perry Saturn. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't see them, you know, feuding uh, the ECW guys, say, with, you know, Benoit or Eddie Guerrero or the Hardy Boys or anything like that. I mean, they could. I think they may go that high. You think? Maybe not. I mean, they I were sure mentioning the Dudleys as, like, former ECW stars and everything like that. Well, they could. They could, but that's also Paul, you know, trying to get over with his audience. You yeah. Know, and not feel, you know, you know it's like... Paul, you know, like, one of the things why, why the Lawler mention was made by Heyman, I believe, is because I think that Heyman didn't want to come in, and, and you know, by praising Lawler, people wouldn't be mad at him for replacing Lawler because he praised him. I think that was his way of, you know, knowing that he wasn't going to live up to the Lawler thing because it was his first weekend and he just wasn't going to be able to, and that way to kind of muffle that because I don't think, you know, he wasn't happy being thrown in that situation because he thought whoever was in that situation was thrown into a bad situation. Was, was thrown into a bad spot. Yeah. There um, were the Jerry chants, too, last night. Were there? I didn't hear them. Yeah, in fact, um, there was one segment, I can't remember what Heyman was talking about, but he was talking about something, and they had a they had a shot of him and Ross. And I don't know if it was playing on the Titan Tron or what, and people were pissed off, but they were chanting Jerry. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that, because I didn't, well, I guess I wasn't going to see any signs if there were signs in the audience. You know what? In fact, they didn't, that's interesting, they did not go to the audience for signs very often. Yeah. 
Oh, I didn't even think of that until right now. How did you like uh, Hunter's Pop when he first made his return? <laughs> Man, what a surprise that was. Yeah. The, um, yeah, that was the, you know what's so weird about that is he never acknowledged that, that last, remember last week, the reason they didn't put him on Raw was because they were selling the injury, although they yeah. forgot to tell us. And then he comes back and boy, he sold that injury. Oh yeah, I was beat up so bad. It's like, nah, I need to take a few days off. Yeah, he was like, ah, I was tired. Yeah. I had a tough match. I'll just take a week off. Yeah. Um, the funny thing was he comes out there and he just gets his enormous baby face pop. He gets in the ring. They're still cheering like crazy. He starts cutting his promo, running everybody down. And they start booing and everything like that. And he just had a smirk on his face. And it's just like, I felt like I was reading his mind. This guy just going, I need to see you on the palm of my hand. They absolutely totally love me, but they, uh, they'll play along and boo me as a heel. It's like, I what a position to be in. Yeah. I thought overall, aside from the Trish thing, I thought that was a pretty entertaining show. I thought um, Guerrero and Jericho with the Benoit thing, I thought that was well done. Mm-hmm. Good match. Very good match. Uh, Hardy's and Dudley's was pretty well done. Fairly good match. Um, Fast-paced. Main event? I thought main event was tr was tremendous. Oh, yeah. Those guys are awesome. Fast-paced. You know, I was um, so happy when it was over that there was no big show run in. Because I was sitting there about halfway through going, God, these four guys are really damn good. And I just was thinking, they're going to have the, the big show run in and ruin this. I just know it. And they didn't, so I was happy. Now let's get to Lex Luger. <laughs> that was the Is most it time for a break yet? Uh, three minutes. Three okay. minutes. I guess we have time. That was the most... We'll talk about the rest of Nitro afterwards. Lex Luger... We, we now, when they announced that match on Friday, okay, I knew... I knew... It would be him. <laughs> I knew what Lex Luger was going to do. I knew he was going to lose, and I knew that he was going to put on this match where it was so obvious he was going to lose, and that Sean O'Hare was not getting over. And Sean O'Hare was not elevated. It was it did him no good to be part of that match. Lex Luger did every single move in the entire match like he didn't care. Like it's like it's amazing to that every move and every transition you could just read on his face. I don't care. I don't care. I'm doing a job. This guy's not in my league, in my mind, and I'm doing a job, and this place is garbage, and I'm putting no effort in, and I want you all to know, I'm putting no effort into this match. I mean, it was unbelievable watching it. I know. It was everything he did, everything he normally does in slow motion, and it was even slower on this show, and uh, I, I think that not only did Sean O'Hare not get over, I think they actually hurt him with that match, because first off... He came out of it looking like he didn't beat anybody, because Luger was just like, just, you know, whatever. Who did he really beat? It took, plus it took somebody running in and everything like that. Plus, they did the goofball thing. Plus, the nature of that run-in. You know, you know the other things? You know, it, it, the way that that match was done, where you had Bagwell and Palumbo both running in and running around, and the referee seeing Yeah, it, right in front of the ref. Doing, right in front of the ref, and the ref doing nothing at that point in your mind. I mean, I know it's fan. At that point in my mind, I'm, I'm, it's like that click-off, it's like, this is all garbage. Nothing matters because they're, they're running in front of the ref like that. So when he, so if he wins, loses, or whatever, none of this is. It's already past the point where any of it matters anyway. Yeah, and then they do the thing where he does the uh, the Scotty Too Hotty deal, where he does a little flip off the top and blows his knee out. And I thought, would Hunter ever do it? Something like that, where he he was a klutz? No. Would Rock? No. Would Steve Austin? No. Would Goldberg? Um, on purpose? No. And they do it with Sean O'Hare. It just made him look like such an idiot. And then when he gets the win, Bagwell gives him a blockbuster anyway. Yeah. And plus, the, the win, the, the big move, was not his Shantan bomb. It was Bagwell's blockbuster. Yeah. You know, he, he did it on Luger first. Yep. So. His thing was anyway. just an afterthought. Um, I thought that the Cruiserweight guys worked their asses off. I think they did way too much. I mean, they were diving to the point where it was just... They were like know. three dive series. Yeah, it was One at the beginning, one in the middle, and one at the end. Yeah. I mean, they they oh, they overworked, and then the camera, the camera worker, the director, the director was totally out to lunch. She was missing stuff all over the place. Although I, it probably would have been fairly hard because they were doing stuff all over the place. It'd be pretty hard to catch everything. But they, I mean, even in the main event when like Paige hit the, uh, or what happened? Oh, Rick hit his bulldog and goes for the cover like it's going to be the finish, and they cut backstage. Oh yeah. How can you miss well, everything on a show like that? Uh, it's not the first time that's happened either. Um, also, I thought the, the, the segment with the cat in Canyon in the hospital was so lame. <laughs> I mean, it, it was just like, 
I, I don't know. I, it was. It, it was. I, I was having this this thought of the uh, Steve Austin Undertaker uh, embalming angle from a couple of years ago, which I hated. And this was sort of like it wasn't that bad, as bad as the other one. But it was just so weird how the cat would be, you know, like saving the girl, and then he's the baby face saving the girl. Okay, first of all, that he's waiting in the hospital for the for the running anyway. Okay, so he saves the girl, and then he gets beat up. Mm -hmm. Then he makes his comeback. Then he gets beat up again. Then he makes his comeback. And I'm just thinking, like, can't you just do your little message? The longer you're in here, the worse it gets. Um, Plus, everyone at home is going, well, where's all the staff? Oh, yeah, and she's screaming for help. At least she got a, at least she got her face back on TV. I thought we'd never see her again. <laughs> <laughs> we got to run to a break right... Yeah. Anything is, po anything is possible these days. I was um, just watching we... it, and it was like the poor man's Steve Austin, Vince McMahon. And right when the brawl started, I thought, okay, bedpan, there's the bedpan. Okay, defibrillator. Oh, there's the defibrillator. It's just like <laughs> the exact same thing, but not nearly as funny. Well, and plus it's a copy. Yeah. And plus it just, like, was so... I mean, like, with, with Vince McMahon and everything, it really was funny. And this was just, like, a whole bunch of stuff thrown out there to copy, but with no... I mean, the humor wasn't there, even though it was, it was, a, it was like a bad attempt at humor. Yeah, yeah. And tomorrow we're going to be having a tape show, because I'm going to be out of town, and uh, it's the show with Bobby Heenan, Frank Shamrock, and Don Fry. It's an awesome show. Uh, Brian is the fourth funniest guy on the show, me being last again. And uh, anyway, that uh, so anyway, that's tomorrow. Thursday will be Brian and myself. Friday we're going to have Les Thatcher on, and next week we've got, uh, got a full schedule. We've got Jeff Merrick's going to be in next week, Cody Monk from the Dallas Morning News for the first time on the show. Ken Shamrock will be on right before he leaves for Japan for the Pride fight. And uh, Luthez, next Monday. Luthez, the many people's pick as the wrestler of the century, just before his 85th birthday. He'll be turning 85 on April the 16th. So he will be the oldest guest because he's only done the show once when he was a year younger at the time. A year and a half younger. So anyway, so those of you, if you have any questions about wrestling in the 30s, 40s and 50s, which almost none of us were born that are listening to the show, but any curiosity, everyone from that era, with the exception of a handful of people, are dead. This is the only alive man who was actually the top guy in the business during that entire period, or one of the top guys during that entire period, and it's the closest thing to a first-person story that, or, or a version of history that we're ever going to get. So you got to rely on 50-year-old memory. It is, a, it is a first-person version. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. In some cases, it's going to be a 70-year-old memory, but it's the only one who was actually there. Yep. I mean, Mushnick's not even alive anymore. I'm talking about Sam. Sam Mushnick's not even alive anymore. So, so there's nobody else. Uh, Barnett, but Barnett would Barnett never came along till the till the 50s. I mean, mm -hmm. so that's, I'm trying to think who else was like really on top that's still around. I mean, Stu Hart, but Stu Hart was always up in in in. Uh, he started later, and he was always you know pretty much up in Canada. He wasn't in the you know involved in the mainstream. I mean, I'm sure there's some people around. Hogan? Are those... <laughs> okay. Anyway, we were talking about Nitro. Um, I, you know, we talked about that uh, the thing with uh, Booker T. Uh, we're actually with Nick Dinsmore and Chris Benoit. You know, the run-in DQ and what you feel like when it's over and how Cornette did it right. And then, I, then right after the show, I'm watching Booker T and Rick Steiner. And they do the exact same thing. And, and actually, I'm not complaining about this because when it was over and they did that run, and I'm going, oh, God. But then when I saw that they were setting up a tag match, I go, okay, at least we're going to get a pin in the tag match, which, in fact, we got. And DDP got a pin, which makes sense, being that DDP's challenging for the title in the main event. So when the show was over, it was, you know, it was all right. It was just, but my immediate feeling was, you know, here's Booker T. He's got Rick Steiner pinned, and then Scott runs in for the DQ, and it's just like, you know, yeah. it's just, it gets done so much. I mean, overall, like, the show to me was just like, well, there was a Nitro. And, I mean, with, I don't know, they need to have, like, the most extraordinary shows every single week. It's not going to happen, and nothing's going to happen different until, I mean, everything is in a holding pattern until this sale thing gets worked out in one way or another, and there's someone in charge who can... Yeah, who can, like, but I don't fully believe that, because they didn't have to put Sean O'Hare and Lex Luger in there with that atrocity and some of the other stuff that they did. Okay, okay, that's, well, you got to remember that that's still the thing where they don't really get it. And they don't. They don't get that, like, certain guys, 
I, I mean, you know, what, what veteran in that company? Okay, let's think about this one. What veteran in that company actually puts people over? I mean, maybe Flair, to where they actually get over. Uh, I mean, Luger doesn't. Nash doesn't. You know, I mean, he can lose every. When was the last time? When, when the few times Nash loses, he doesn't put the other guy over. Um, who are the other top guys? Jarrett. Jarrett can do an extent if they really want him to. Yeah. Uh, he he will do it. Steiner really doesn't. Page doesn't. You know, when Page loses, he he rarely puts the other guy over. I mean, a young guy, maybe a top guy, he will. But like, I remember when Page worked I'm with Kidman. I'm taking back to Kidman. Yeah, when Page worked remember with Kidman. That one? And pa yeah, Page lost to Kidman, but he didn't put Kidman over at all. Mm -hmm. So most of those guys, I mean, the problem with them being clever enough to lose by a pinfall, just like Scott Hall used to do. Scott Hall lost more matches by pinfall than anyone, and he never put anybody over. Yeah. Except for Goldberg. Well, I think everyone kind of put Goldberg over because they knew they had to. Because um, maybe somebody would, like, tell Goldberg, hey, Bill, they really double-crossed you, and, you know, he can't get mad, he's so big. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as, let's see. Very surprised to see uh, Chavo Guerrero beat Shane Helms. Didn't understand it at all. Uh, Is that a pay-per-view match? Yes, with Shane challenging for the title. So in the non-title match, the champion won. Did not understand that. Uh, Probably because uh, Shane's going to beat him. Okay, then, I'll, then if he does, then that makes sense. I mean, with the entrance they gave Shane and I like uh, that. the fact that he, he got beat, I think it's like almost a certainty that he's going to go over. Okay, I thought that the interest for Shane was really good because that is one thing where I saw it, where you see an improvement, and that is one of the areas they need to improve his ring entrance. And the other thing I thought was I thought Kid Romeo showed a hell of a lot of charisma. Yeah, I thought he did very well. I don't know if it was because um, I mean, right when he debuted, I don't know if it was his music had like crowd cheering added to it or something like that, but it seemed there, like people were really noise. reacting to him. But then there as soon as the music was there over, was a lot the place of noise. just died. So I think there was, was a lot of no, there was a lot of noise piped in. Okay, that had to be it. Because I, I asked about that, I thought, wow, I go, Kid Romeo got a really good reaction, and I was saying like, you know, that shows what happens when you actually build somebody up rather than have them just appear. And it's like, well, a lot of that was piped in. So. The funny thing was, right when the music ended, everybody died immediately, and right then I thought, okay, thumbs up here. Yeah, but they, um, again, like all those guys. I mean, yeah, you you certainly can't fault those four guys for a lack of effort in that match. And as far as the the Dusty and Flair thing, I was, you know, I guess because, of, because you know, I grew up watching those guys, especially Dusty, I really grew up watching him. I was just sad. You know, I really want, I was sitting there going like, I wanted them, I mean, I know that in the ring, you know, Flair took a bump for something that Dustin Rhodes forgot to do, and Flair just went down, it was the most ridiculous looking thing. And then didn't, then Jared took that bump that they showed in slow, and not in slow-mo, but in the replay, that Dusty's elbow came nowhere near him and he took a bump, so that stuff was sad. But what was really sad was when all of a sudden done, I mean, I knew physically Ric Flair in that costume, and he is 52 years old, and Dusty, you know, I mean, Dusty's been retired forever, that, you know, they're, they're not going to give us something physically that's anything special. But I really figured when they did the mic work, you know, Dusty Rhodes doing mic work for the first, for the second time on, on TBS in years, and Flair, you know, when Flair has an issue and knows what to do, you know, Flair's one of the greatest talkers of all time, and, and Dusty, to his credit, probably was, is one of them as well. And I just thought that they both came off like such old men trying to talk. They didn't have it. And, it. and it was in Greenville where, you know, all those people grew up watching Flair and Dusty in the 80s, and I, I just felt... Were they I felt in Greenville last them. night? What? Were they in Greenville last night? They were in Greenville, yeah. Of course, none of those people want to boo Flair, you know that. Oh, yeah. But still, but I mean, forget about Flair. I mean, they will cheer Dusty, those people. I mean, the thing to me with Dusty was, I didn't understand one word he said. No, his interview was was so weak, other than going on and on about fin finally getting to call Flair Fat Boy, since Flair called him Fat Boy for, you know, 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, the other thing, there's something about Flair in that makeup, and, and, you know, wearing those pants, so he looked like he was 400 pounds, and then Dusty, who really is, like, looking like he's 400 pounds. And, you know, the idea of those two guys being old, just like... Hit you in the face. I mean, I think it it was too much. It was an exaggeration of flair, but enough. But there was enough reality there where it just was like, oh my god, you know, these guys are just are just so old. And the thing was with Flair when he took the makeup off, he still had enough makeup on that he looked like 150 years old. He took good bumps for a 150 year old guy. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh. but but you know, just the whole. You know, they're going to be doing the tag match. And totally and ignoring the fact that he's supposed to be retired. 
Well, they're going to be doing a tag match. Well, I can work with Dusty. You know, let's see, they're in Jacksonville. Maybe the people will give Dusty a break because it's Jacksonville. They probably, you know, it's not going to mean anything for the buy rate. Um, you know, the other thing about I think it is Dustin. Decent. I hope so. Uh, the problem also is, is uh, Dustin just just doesn't got it. I mean, Jared I barely really doesn't either. I mean, although he's competent, there's something about Dustin. He's got like negative charisma. It's like his dad got all of it. All of it. His like dad it only wasn't five... split or anything. His dad got enough for five guys, and poor Dustin has to pay for it. He's got negative four. Yeah. Anyway, any other news before we hit emails? We've got tons of emails. Uh, let's go to emails. All right. This is from Michael. What do all the references to Kool-Aid mean? It's actually a Jim Jones reference that actually was started by Jim Cornette, who would talk about ECW fans and people who believe Paul Heyman as drinking the Kool-Aid, like the Jim Jones followers, which drank the Kool-Aid, and then they all died many years ago. And then Jim Ross mentioned it in a Ross report, but he meant it as a compliment, saying, I'm willing to drink his Kool-Aid, which means blindly following uh, the vision of Paul Heyman, if he were to just come to the company. So then people got mad at Jim Ross. By the way, just so everyone knows, there will be no more controversy in Jim Ross hotlines. That's my prediction. It is. Okay, this is from Ben Smith. This has absolutely nothing to do with anything that we've talked about. I am so sick and tired of those few marks out there who still think Vince Russo was so great. Apparently, ruining WCW was not enough for these people to realize the message. The guy yesterday who said in the list of wrestlers Russo got over doesn't get it. You and Brian were on top of the fraud from day one that Russo, and I appreciated your insights. That's a good one. Uh, let's see. I already sent you a letter from Scott Keith about the Trish Vince thing. Yeah, put that in this week's Observer. I don't know if it will make the cut, but I think it will. Uh, very interesting letter by Scott Keith about uh, the Trish Vince thing. What is the thinking behind muddying up the Rock Austin match with another three or four subplots? It's already sold out the Astrodome, almost. But yeah, it's right. I'm sure adding Deborah, Vince, and Stephanie to the mix isn't going to sell any more tickets. Have they forgotten WrestleMania six? You know, that's why I really didn't want Shawn Michaels to referee that match. I just wanted them to just—they don't need to do anything. It's like you don't need to add any angles. You just need to put those two guys in the ring. You're going to have your huge buy rate, and and nothing's going to add to it. Anything you add to it is actually a, subtract, a subtraction. Especially Deborah. Yeah, because it's like, why do you need to tell people, aha, there's going to be some sort of a screw job? Because the people, I mean, well, even though they won't get it, the people want to see Rock and Austin, and they want to see a clean pinfall. And they really don't care who wins because they like both guys. I mean, yeah. people will care who wins, but either one who wins, it's an acceptable finish. Mm -hmm. But when it's like, you don't need a garbage finish for that one. So anyway, Rock is over, Austin is over, one has the title, the other wants it, and he's been waiting for it. There's your match. The formula's worked for 100 years, and reinventing the wheel with the soap opera crap isn't helping anyone. Totally agree with that one. Further, didn't Jerry Lawler just get forced out of the WF for trying to pull a power play and get his wife in a major angle? Isn't that exactly what Steve Austin is doing now? We don't know if Austin suggested that. We don't know that he didn't. I kind of uh, doubt that he would. I kind of doubt that he would, too, but I'll check on that. Or did I just miss all the bring Deborah back signs at ringside? <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me if this sounds a bit weird, but I've had several people tell me that the Steph Trish exchange seems to be leading towards a lesbian angle. I don't think so. But uh, I don't think so. This is Vince Paul Heyman well. tried that once and nearly got you know booted off the air. In fact, actually, in fact, I think he was Sunshine Network over that one, didn't he? Paul? He, Paul Heyman. Originally, mm -hmm. he got back on Sunshine Network like a year later, but he got he lost. I remember when they did the lesbian angle with uh, was it Kimona and um, who was Beulah. The one? Beulah. No, it was Beulah. Was it Beulah and Kimona? I remember Beulah. I think yeah. it was. When, yeah. Yeah, it was. It was okay. Wait, when they did that, I mean, then he dropped that angle like a week later because there was so much, and he got he, he lost a TV thing on it. So, and remember, Vince tried to do it with um, wasn't it with Terry and Sable, Terry Ronaldson and Sable a few years ago, and they dropped that one like a week later too. Yeah. Or two weeks later. Um, go, oh, let's see. Uh, after seeing Paul Heyman on Raw, does that mean ECW is officially dead? Yes. Okay. And I don't want any more. Maybe it's not. Is there a pay per view? There is no pay per view Sunday. I've been saying there's no pay per view Sunday for a couple of weeks. I didn't say there's no pay per view Sunday to just talk. I knew it. There's been no official announcement yet. There is no, but there is no pay per view. There has been no pay per view for several weeks. Okay. Uh, if an ECW invasion angle were to happen, do you think the ECWs would guys would be heel or baby faces? No, whatever they want to portray them as. Do you think we're always beating Nitro head to head? could be attributed to the Encore presentation of Nitro. No, I'm not going to read the rest of this letter. Uh, let's see. Just Last like how uh, there was the Encore presentation back when Nitro was winning the ratings. 
Right. Remember, remember when Nitro was winning the ratings and the, the WWF people would say how, like, Ted Turner bought the ratings somehow? Oh, yeah. yeah. There were all these convoluted things. They're rigged. Yeah, just like the XFL. Somehow the ratings are fine for Raw, but they're convoluted for, for uh, uh, XFL. Uh, let's see. This is from Don, who goes, Last week I emailed you after Trish got slopped, like, uh, was like a Jericho Benoit disease working hard, but then to get degraded the next night, well, that could be more like an untalented big oaf squashing, like, let's say, China. China. Interesting. Uh, but what happened last night was way over the line. I'm guessing they want to get sympathy on Trish, and then she can get revenge, but they portrayed her as a person with no self-respect and backbone, so why would the fans want to get behind that? Last night's segment was one of the most uncomfortable 15 minutes of Raw I've ever seen. I don't know what was worse, the whole stripping in front of a live audience, watching the crowd go so insane and happy over it, or Jim Ross trying to convince everyone that it was a bad thing while the crowd was popping so big for it. Every minute... Passing by, worse than the next. I was waiting for something to happen, like Austin's glass breaking, a Y2J countdown, even fully car crash. Anything to save this segment, but nothing. Uh, so I squirmed in my seat until it ended thinking about how bad it was, and I didn't feel normal wrestling heat against a character or sympathy for another. I just felt sick watching this. I felt sick for the, watching the crowd in the arena. I just felt sick for being a fan of this. To the wrestling writers, telling a man to tell a woman to strip does not make him a bad guy. It makes him a hero. It's sad but true. I think that part they knew. I think that the crowd reaction, I don't think anyone was surprised with the crowd reaction. Okay? I, so anyway. Uh, let's see. Every, this is from Sean. Everyone I was watching Raw with died laughing at the Trish of Vince Angle. Maybe we're a bunch of chauvinist pigs. Uh, let's see. Um, after watching last night's Raw, I'm convinced that Vince Man despises women. What do you think? I think he despises government officials, too. Yeah. I think he despises a lot of people, actually. Media? <laughs> he should have rolled up an observer and spanked her with it. <laughs> what do you think of Lance Storm writing a book now? Do you think he should wait till his career is over? I'll tell you what. When it comes to that, let's read the book first. Um, I mean, he's been a lot of places. He may have some really funny stories, and he may not. Also, do you think Bret Hart's book will be better than Foley's or Dynamite's? You know what? I think it will. I really think that Bret Hart's book, I think that, well, i say this. Bret Hart's book will be far more informative, guaranteed, and far more honest. As, as honest as Foley's book really was, and Dynamite's book really was, I think Bret Hart's will, will for sure be more honest and more informative. I don't think it will be nearly as funny as Foley's, and I don't think it will be... Uh, I, I, I mean, some issues, I think there was some stuff about Dynamite's book because of the pranks and everything that made it so gripping. And I don't know, Bret's book may be way better than that. It may not be. Um... But I, I, I think his book, of all the books that are coming out, and of course I could be dead wrong on this one, but I think that, I think his book will be the best of the ones that aren't. Anyway, I think it has potential to be better, and I'm expecting it to be better. I, I am too. What about you, Brian? I think that the like the one thing with Foley's book was it kind of skirted over some issues, and the one yeah. thing with Dynamite's book was some of his memories might not have been completely accurate, and I think with Brett he's gonna go deeper on a lot of things, and he also has just, you know, tons of notes, so it's not like things are going to be totally inaccurate, so it probably the, will be. The accuracy of the Bret Hart book will be more than any wrestling book, for sure, because he had been taking notes, you know, for, you know, 22 years. I mean, literally, he's kept a diary, and he's not going to have wrong dates, and he's, you know what I'm saying, those type yeah. of things that, you know, if you just did it by memory, even though you're not being dishonest, you would make mistakes. Let's say Dynamite did. Let's say Dynamite did that, and I, you know, I don't think Dynamite was ever trying to be dishonest in the book. Um, you know, those mistakes won't be there. That's why, from an accuracy standpoint, I think it'll be, oh, it'll be the best for accuracy, for sure. Uh, it says, poor Trish is paying for the XFL. And you're not the only one who said that. Yes, she is. Uh, uh, ben Moore, I was pretty disappointed by last night's Raw. Really? I mean, I thought, you know, aside from that, it was a hell of a show. After all the hype by ECW's homepage, I guess we've learned never to listen to hype. Well, I guess if you were watching it for an ECW invasion, you'd be disappointed because there was nothing there. No ECW names, not even just incredible. All in all, it looked like the WF went back to sports entertainment instead of wrestling. What are your thoughts on the non-action run? I, I, I don't know. I thought it was a really good action run raw. Uh, let's see. Is there anything more awesome than Vince McMahon grabbing Trish Stratus' leopard skin jacket, throwing it over his shoulder, and strutting his way out of the ring? Uh, I don't know. I think maybe I've seen stuff more, more than that. Uh, let's see. Who was Super Invader? Super Invader. Wasn't that Warlord? I don't know. There was a, if you remember, he was a large mask man whose mask looked like red pantyhose that Bill Watts brought in for Harley Race to manage. Maybe it was Hercules Hernandez. I'm trying to remember. Because I think it was Mike Enos. Yeah, it might have been Mike Enos. 
A friend of mine says it was Glenn Jacobs or Dan Spivey. It was definitely not Glenn Jacobs, because he wasn't even around then. Uh, Dan Spivey. Super Invader, somebody tell me. I have forgotten. Uh, oh, Regal was great. Regal was great last night. Yeah, he was. He's always uh, great. Uh, let's see. One Wrestling is reporting the 4.5 for the WF was their lowest non-holiday rating ever since the move to TNN. Yes, it was. I think the previous low was a 4.8. Except for the, during the Christmas season, they were lower. So, Not only that, it's the lowest rating for Raw, uh, I would say, in several years. Because they never, on USA, you'd have to go back a couple of years before you did a 4.5. Mm -hmm. uh, some person says, I enjoyed Paul Heyman's announcing, but I was expecting something more rebellious. Maybe in time when they let him be rebellious. Um... We have not talked about Thunder yet. We also have a full bank of phone calls. We have tons of email. I'm going to go through Thunder as quick as I can. Uh, three Count beat Jason Broyles, who's Easy Money, and Scotty O, who used to be Scotty Saber. That's the cruiserweight match. Jamie Noble was supposed to team with Scotty O, but Jamie Noble's wife gave birth. So Jason Broyles, who was supposed to get a tryout match with Dan Fakur, back there, whatever, whatever his ring name is, uh, got moved up to the main show, so those of you who want to see Easy Money, he's going to be on Nitro tomorrow, and I heard he looked good, and I heard this was a pretty decent match. Sean Stasiak beat Snorman Smiley. Heard this match was terrible. Um, How I can talk be? I talked to someone in the company, because I'd gotten a correspondence report from someone who had seen it, actually two, and they both said that it was terrible, and then I talked to someone in the company, and it was like, after Lex Luger and Sean O'Hare, you just cannot use the word terrible for anything on this show. Uh, <laughs> Rich, Rich Steiner beat Hugh Morris. Uh, with all the expected run-ins, Team Canada came out to attack Hugh Morris. Conan made the save, which makes two saves in a row that Conan made. Or three. Three saves, because there was one in the show, too. Uh, Palumbo beat Lex Luger. That was supposed to be a tag match with Luger and Bagwell against O'Hare and Palumbo. But uh, Bagwell's got a neck injury, so they made it a single match. Lance Storm beat Conan. Mike Awesome and Hugh Morris were involved in that, setting up a tag team. So How awesome. was Palumbo and Luger, did you hear? I didn't even ask. Probably um, didn't need to, actually. Yeah. The, um, what was I going to say, the, they're doing, you know, um, Conan and Hugh Morris as a tag team to replace Chronic in the spot against uh, Storm and Awesome, because Chronic's out for, you know, because of uh, Brian Adams' appendectomy. So that gimmick where uh, Lance Storm and Hugh Morris had their last match ever is out the window? Um, yeah, they're, they're back programmed with each other. Okay, just wondering. Yeah. Yes. Uh, then Lance, okay, Lance Storm beat Conan, and so I guess that, that's where Conan got his, his three run-ins where he didn't get punked in a row. I think that was to set him up for doing a job on TV. Uh, Scott Steiner beat the Cat with Steiner Recliner. Rick Steiner was out there at the end. Booker T was around. Of course, DDP was around. Ended up with, uh, Jarrett, Luger, and Animal all jumping DDP and Steiner putting him in the Steiner Recliner. Then Conan, Chuck Palumbo, and Hugh Morris and Booker T came out for the save, and the show ends at that point, so... Anyway, uh, let me go through some of this. Because I know it's from Dominic. I know Paul Heyman gave some great quotes last night on Raw, but you may have missed Tony Schiavone's quote during the Mike Awesome Hugh Morris match. He goes, These are two big men for their size. He didn't really say that. <laughs> it's right up there with the WWF Titan show, where during a match with Lord Alfred Hayes, he said, quote, Dusty Rhodes always works hard to keep in tip top shape. I remember that. I always thought that was really funny. Did the Wrestling Observer ever print a transcript of Hulk Hogan's testimony at the WF steroid trial? Not word for word, but um, in, I guess it would be in an August issue of 1994. Um, there's like a double issue, and it's got the whole trial. I mean, I mean, it's got that trial analyzed to death. And um, it's got, you know, all of Hogan's, it's got everything that Hogan said. It's got uh, inflections and things like that that just reading a transcript wouldn't tell you. But it is not a word for word transcript. Uh, what did you think of the chemistry with J.R. and Heyman? I think they had none. Uh, they had some, just not as much as before. Uh, I mean, as much as uh, we had with Lawler. Um, as a wrestling fan, I enjoyed Nitro more than Raw. Well, except for the one thing, I don't know. Although Paul Lee was doing commentary, that was my highlight of the show. Raw seemed to be just another show to me, nothing special. It seemed to be killing time until WrestleMania, when they can finally start new programs. Well, well what was, was Nitro that? then? What, but what was Benoit and Guerrero? What was the Hardy Boy split? What was the tag team title change? I mean, I mean, what do you? I mean, what do you want from the TV? And I thought that the stuff with Austin and Rock, the fact that they didn't pull the trigger on it, I think it's awesome that they're like everyone knows that they're gonna split in one of these tag matches. And the longer they don't split, probably the better. They threw Deborah in there, which even though I don't like it, it is a storyline advancement. Yeah. Uh, one thing we see. didn't mention was uh, Hunter's promo at the beginning of the show. 
astutely pointing out that every time he faces Rocky, he beats him. And every time he faced, and he beat Austin too. And he beat Austin in two straight matches, and thus he deserves the slot at WrestleMania. And it made perfect sense. What a surprise. Yeah. Not only that, but they had, uh, anyway, Nitro seemed to get some things done for once. Let's see what, what we Let's see, what did Nitro get done? They, uh, well, killed, I'm, I'm trying uh, to find it out. Sean uh, let's see. Uh, I don't. Be- I, I still believe for a casual fan, WF is more entertaining due to star power. WCW seems to have a better in-ring product as of late. I don't buy that. Although, the, the, I mean, I the cruiserweight guys worked their ass off, but I mean, I that that Raw show had really good in-ring product. I thought. I mean, any you know, we gone through the matches. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. That thing with Trish was a total waste of time. You made the comment that maybe they're doing this in hopes of having people pay money to see Trish and Playboy. As much as I like Trish, and as weird as it sounds, I hope she doesn't pose because then her career will be over. Look at Sable in China. Well, Sable's career was over having nothing to do with posing in Playboy. It happened to do with her filing suit <laughs> against them. In China, while I would be very happy that I never see her again and her career would be over. The fact is, it's not over. She's just out promoting a book. And her book's, like, high on the bestseller list, so she's not doing badly. Uh, once you show everything, you have nothing left. Is it for sure Trish will pose or not? Uh, I, I've never been told for sure. It just seems, watching wrestling, this is how they're building. Also, the writers must really hate Trish to make her do all those degrading things that go o- over and beyond pro wrestling. Uh, there are definitely people who... Um, there are definitely people who are not her friends in that company, because friends do not make their friends do things like that. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's, let's start with Brian in Arkansas. Brian, what's going on? Hey, what's going on, guys? Not hey. too much. I had an opinion I wanted to run by you guys and see what you thought about this regarding the Lawler cat situation. Yes. I think the one thing that nobody has ever said is that, that nobody thinks that it could be a work. Oh, no, we discussed that earlier in the show tonight. Well, I, okay, well, I, did, I didn't hear that. Um, I mean, it, 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 it could be. Time will, time will tell. On all these angles, time tells you know the truth. And, and I don't rule it out as a possibility. I and it could be real now and end up an angle. Right. I just, yeah. I, just, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, there are things that happened and certain reactions. You know, and again, and I could be wrong, but you know, having dealt with all these people and, and, and afterwards and know when just certain reactions to people, Waller would have to be a hell of an actor, which the problem is he is, uh, for it to be a work. <laughs> But I, um, there's things that Lawler did uh, that make me think it's not a work. But if it turns out to be, I'm, I'm not shocked out of my mind. You know, we'll, 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 as I said, we'll know. If he shows up at WrestleMania, um, that means at least it could. It, there's a good chance it was an angle. If he, if he shows up on WCW, then we know that it's not. It just seemed odd that WWF.com reported it so quickly. Uh, they report it, they report everything so quickly. That's not odd at all. Well, now, the I mean, fact the fact that it was mentioned on television surprised me. But then I thought back. Remember when Jeff Jarrett walked out with uh, Road Dog um, after that Nashville pay per view where he had that great match with Shawn Michaels? Yeah. I remember when Jarrett walked out. Okay, and I'd heard all the stories. Jarrett walked out afterwards, and I'm thinking angle, angle, angle. And then the next night on TV, they kept saying Jeff Jarrett had walked. Jeff Jarrett walked out. This and this and this. I'm going for sure an angle. And then. People in the company go, it's not an angle. And I go, well, why'd you say it on television? And it's like, that was just our, you know, they just did. So, and that was not an angle. He ended up in WCW, you know, after that. So, there's a, pre- I mean, I was thinking back, there are a lot of precedents for people leaving, and you know, not just Bret Hart, which was a t- totally different story, of people leaving and then being mentioned on the next television show, which in the 80s did go against what Vince would do. Right, well, that's all I had for you. Okay. All right. Uh, Plus, I mean, Jerry Lawler was, he really was a high profile character. I mean, there's a lot of wrestlers that can miss a show and, you know, it's, it's not like it's a really huge deal or anything like that, or you can, they can walk out of the company and you can take him out of the storyline, but to have the announce booth on Raw, when they opened that show and it was just Jim Ross sitting there all by himself, there's not one fan in the entire world that would not go, hey, where the hell is Jerry Lawler? So maybe it had to be mentioned briefly. Yeah, I mean, what are you going to say? Then, Just, oh, uh, here's Paul Heyman. Well, you know, the one thing also is they mentioned it briefly, and they never mentioned it again. Except for you know, if they had mentioned it five times during the show, uh, that would be different. You know, like with Bret Hart. You know, it, but, you know, like Bret Hart's a totally different issue, actually. But, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But again, you know, time will tell. I'm not, you know, it is Jerry Lawler and it is Vince McMahon, and they are both workers. So, you know, it, is, it, it certainly is a possibility. Uh, it's more about Trish, which doesn't say anything that we haven't said before. 
But he goes, um, this is, um, uh, da, 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 da. who will know, work? Why would they have started the whole RTC thing with Cat? Yeah, well, that's 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 another thing. And they dropped that angle last night. I mean, as far as I mean, you know, like there was no mystery woman sleeping with Bo Buchanan, which was the plan for uh, last night's show originally. Yeah. So they just dropped the angle cold, and they never acknowledged Valvina sleeping with the mystery woman. It's kind of like they. They, they just figured, well, we'll do what we got planned on TV on SmackDown since it was at the last minute. Maybe he'll come and, back. Well, maybe they were, maybe that is what they were thinking. And then on Monday, it was just like they didn't acknowledge any of it even happened. Yeah. Like they didn't even acknowledge. That's another reason why I think it probably wasn't because they would have, they would have had a way to to, to uh, continue this RTC angle that would be a lot more smooth rather than ignore what happened on SmackDown. Mm-hmm. Um. But what, Brian, what was it? Do you remember exactly what the, what the rating was for that first segment? The, the first segment, segment of what, Raw? No, the Trish, the Trish Stratus segment. No, I don't have the uh, quarters in front of me. Okay. Uh, let's see. This is also... It was generally uh, it was generally like uh, mid-fours, and okay. I don't think it spiked or anything. Um, because they should have been... Like I said, they were expecting a six out of that segment. Yeah. I don't even think they hit a five. If they didn't hit a five, then that... Seg- then that, then that, then that not hitting a five at the 10, 10 o'clock to ten fifteen hours is a big flop, mm-hmm. which is interesting. That's just interesting because again, you know, in previous incarnations of women taking their clothes off at ten o'clock, the ratings has, have spiked almost every time. That's yeah. I mean I expect I expected that to do well. Uh, this is from Chris Schneider, who mentions about uh, more about Trish, and he goes. Combining that with a commercial for the XFL, that, that, where they flat out said that in a desperate effort to increase ratings, they put on camera in the cheerleaders' locker room. The t- the, and he goes, the Tillman Ventura angle was dead on arrival, as, as it turns out it was. I've been watching the XFL pretty regularly since opening weekend because, quite frankly, some of the less than stellar regular plays sets up pretty entertaining stuff like actually seeing the 25-yard live ball rule in effect and some wild return off of turnovers. It's great. Is it great football? No. But it's entertaining, and having most of the teams pretty well, even in terms of ability, is far more competitive than the NFL the past several years. Unfortunately, these desperate measures to try and draw ratings are actually making me want more not to watch the show this weekend. Uh, and he goes, love the, Bo- he goes, love the Bobby Heenan and Frank Shamrock show from last Friday. Bobby Heenan's closing remark about drinks on the house, eyeballs are on the giraffe, gave me a very much needed chuckle when I heard it. I hope that one, that one ends up on the archive links for anyone who misses it and will miss the replay. Well, anyway, that's a good advertisement for the replay. Uh, Super Invader was Hercules Hernandez, so again, that's cleared up. And also, got a couple of emails, this was from a couple of days ago, about Killer Khan. Killer Khan, on his 1987, I believe, trip to the World Wrestling Federation, did use the Green Mist uh, gimmick uh, in a feud with Hulk Hogan. He didn't do it the first time with Andre. So somebody had called up, and Sheldon Goldberg and myself had forgotten about it, and Brian didn't know about it either, but it, in fact, it was the case. Uh, let's see... Uh, this goes, I just got my TV guide, and they have listed Living Dangerously, so the show is on. Thanks. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, I read on the news board the Hardy Boys asked not to be split up at this time. I don't believe anything I read on the net on these news boards, so I wonder if there's any truth to it. I, I don't know. Um, I will have to ask about that. I know that Madigan's Jeff Hardy was planned for WrestleMania. Um, that may, you know... Plans change every week. Um, I, I want to ask uh, listeners from Canada, did the Trish Stratus thing air? Because this is from someone in Canada who goes, I don't believe they showed the Trish Stratus incident here. Uh, the regular time slot was preempted due to curling. And I don't even, I've never even seen curling in my life. And when they did tune, when they, when I did tune in, I believe the angle was already over. When I taped it from midnight to 2 a.m., they edited it out, which made the show end at two hours. There was no overrun. These angles, like Trish stripping, are very degrading and unnecessary, especially for any parent who sees this would probably let their children watch Raw again. Somehow... Especially those 93% of parents or whatever that watch with their kids. <laughs> and believe um, me, um, you would know uh, if you saw that angle. It's not like something that you would have, uh, might have just slipped your mind. Yeah. Let's go to Jerry in New York. Jerry, what's up? Jerry. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey. How, How you doing? Too much. Uh, a couple comments, a couple questions. And in regards to the WCW, I think I've seen people look more excited at the DMV than I saw Luger looking during that match last night. I thought that was completely uninspired. And even though he's like one of the big top stars in the company, I think there should still be repercussions for it. Because to make somebody else look bad is just, I just don't think it's very professional. The repercussion should have been a long time ago. There there was no reason to bring him back. 
Um, I mean, the idea that because he's got a name, he can get these other guys over by losing to them. I think we've shown with Palumbo and now O'Hare. It sounds good and on Palumbo paper. Palumbo again. And, well, we haven't seen the second Palumbo match, so we don't know. But, but it sounds good on paper, and it was worth a try. It didn't work. There's no purpose for him. He needs to go home. Right. Well, a couple more things. I don't know if you guys caught it or not, but I thought the funniest part of Nitro to me was in the opening segment when they had DDP run out and do the save for, uh, I believe it was Booker T. I don't know if you caught it, but Scott Steiner completely no-sold every single punch that he threw. I mean, not even, he didn't even act like he was there. Then they did the the toss into the ropes. I just thought that was hilarious, and I wonder if it stems back to uh, their little feud that they had, if there's still bad blood between them. I, I don't think it's that. I think it's that's the, the, the kind of how Scott Scott Steiner is trying to like portray Superman, and he really doesn't sell as much as I think he maybe should. Um, and I think that's just his vision of what his character should be to be a strong heel. You know, maybe it's kind of like Hunter. You know, you know how the, Hunter never backs down, Steiner never backs down. Right. Um, you know, I, I maybe maybe that's the feeling because Hunter's kind of like the uh, what is it, the prototype main event heel right now because he's the most over one. And, you know, Scott's a lot bigger, stronger guy than Hunter. And since Hunter, you know, got over that way, then, you know, it's a very selfish business. Hunter can't even bench 360. What's that? <laughs> and what does Scott say he could do, six-something? <laughs> what did he say in that muscle magazine? Oh, I, I it's not a world record. Extraordinary number. He had some ridiculous number. I mean, I'm not saying he can't do it, but I don't think he can. Somehow, you know, if I you always... If were there in, the stu- in your house, um, he could do it. Hey, he'd have to show me. I'd be very skeptical. No, because... You know what used to crack me up? Because cause I, I used to be friends with uh, Doug Furness, who was like one of the strongest men who actually has ever lived, although no one knows that. And, you know, we'll, we would read stuff or hear about stuff that either wrestlers would claim or bodybuilders would claim they could do. And, and Doug Furness couldn't even do this, and he was like tons stronger than any of these people. I mean, he, you know, he was, you know, held 30 plus world records in powerlifting. And then guys would talk about, oh, yeah, you know, I could bench like 500 for 12 reps. And he's just like, you know, I was like, you know, the world champion bench press at one point. I can't do that. This is, you know, it's ridiculous. You know, yeah. it's, like, it's like, and, and you know, like, if a guy goes and claims that he can do, like, 600 or more on a bench, I mean, I want to see it in, in, in a powerlifting meet because if you can do it, then you'd be one of the best in the world. 600 not, is not, I mean, 600 is still, you know, a, a mark that not that many people in this world can do. And for some guy who's never competed in powerlifting, you know, it's like a, a guy who says, I can run the 109 flat, but he's never entered, like, a sprint in his life. Yeah. You know, that's what it's equivalent to. Plus, I mean, anyway. the other thing is there's so many factors. I mean, you're talking about guys this. here that are, like, 6'6", six, six, with the longest arms in the world. And if you have really long arms, you're not going to be benching 600 pounds. Yeah, but we're talking about Scott Steiner. He, he does, you know, Scott Steiner probably can bench press a lot. Yeah. Anyway, let's get back to, uh, let's get back. <laughs> Jerry, I'm sorry. We no, it's no tangent. problem, no problem. I just had um, one last question. Obviously, ECW is done now. I mean, it's a done deal. Any speculation is just foolish. Um, what do you think the next promotion to step up and kind of take their spot is going to be? Because there's really no second-tier promotion now. I mean, it's really independence into the big leagues, and there's no, there's no mediator, there's no middle section or you know farm team like ECW served as for so many people. I know they got uh, APW out in California and XPW, XPW, UPW, and there's yeah, you know there's these, numerous these all, on the East Coast. These, I was just curious as to what promotion you saw taking the step up and, and filling that spot, if any. Well, you know all those promotions that you mentioned out here. I mean, they only really run like one, one, two shows a month, so they're not. You know, I mean, how seriously can that can you take that? I'm not you know knocking them. I'm just saying that like uh, there's I, I don't see any company that's going to fill any of those slots. I don't, I don't see any company on the horizon that's even going to be close to what ECW is. It's whoever, I mean, whoever gets the, the good good television that can be seen on national cable will be in that spot if they can sustain and stay on the air and, 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 run, and run shows, but I don't think anyone's ready for that yet. It's going to take so much money. Well, I mean, you you got to have, like, you know, it's got to be like a Rupert Murdoch and someone who's out yeah. there for the long haul. If it's somebody out there... You know, like those guys at the WXO, I mean, they went in there, they got TV, or the Urban guys, you know, they got it, and they also got TV, but then like six weeks later they were out of money or whatever it was. It's like, if you've got enough money for six weeks, I don't know why anyone would even think of investing in wrestling right now because the short-term return is impossible. Long-term return may be impossible too, but we know short-term doesn't work. 
So unless you've got money to sustain like a couple of years, why start, pay all this money to get on television, and then only have enough money for like three weeks of programming? It, it, it boggles yeah. my mind. Right. All right, guys. Well, enjoy the show a lot. I think Don Fry was one of the best guests you've had in a long time. I thought he was hilarious, and uh, enjoy your show, and take care of yourself. Yeah, thanks very much, and... um that was a surprise. I had no idea what to expect. He was just like, he was just like in the hall. You know what I mean? And I go, hey, there's Don Fry. <laughs> hey, Get Don. in here. Hey, Don. You know, I mean, I, I, I talked to him before, and I never even knew he was funny. He was just, he sort was of just an ultimate. What? He was off. Awesome. I know we got to get, we got to get him on again when, uh, when he's between Japan tours. Uh, by the way, today at Tokyo Oda War, Jim Jushin Liger and El Samurai won the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Title from Koji Kanemoto and Minoru Tanaka. Koji Kanemoto got a separated shoulder, uh, day before, I think it was on Sunday. So he came back, did the match, and dropped the belts. And uh, that's why, I think that's why the belts changed hands. Uh, let's see, let's go to, is it uh, Charles in Connecticut? Hi, how you doing, Dave? Very good, how are you? Uh, not bad. Um, I have a couple questions, comments. Um watched Raw last night, and uh, I wasn't very impressed with Paul Heyman. I know he hasn't done uh, much, co much color commentary in, in several years, but... I just thought he didn't um, he didn't have he didn't really have any chemistry with Jim Ross and he just wasn't I don't know, he just I just didn't think he was very good. Um I still think if if they bring in Bobby Heen and and Bobby Heen and um you know, is it inspired by the product or whatever that that, that could be uh that could be really good if they put him together with Jim Ross. I wanna know what you, uh what you think of that. I mean, it's possible. I, I just don't. I mean, my impression is, you know, they haven't called Bobby Heenan. I think if they wanted him, they'd have gotten him by now. I think that if he was like someone who they were interested in, yeah, because I thought that Heyman was a was about what I expected he would be. I thought he was, you know, you, he, again, he hasn't done it in a while, and he's replacing Waller, and he's you're not going to be smooth with someone, you know, that you haven't worked with before. Heenan, uh. You know, Heenan would probably work well with Raw, but you know, bottom line, they didn't call. They didn't call him. You know, they never called Zabisco. They never called Heenan. So they're obviously we're not thinking in that direction. I don't know. Zabisco doesn't fit into what they do anyway, though. In no. my mind, Especially even though in a lot of people. Position. Yeah. Is, is he going to be? Um, is he going to be booking too? Is he? Uh, like, what's the deal with um, Paul Heenan? I, I would think. I would think they would use him for ideas. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if how much uh, how much uh, you know, he had on last night's show. And it was during the production meeting. I don't know if he was, you know. I'll tell you why. Because the the finish of the uh, main event, you know, where where I think Rock, he helped put that together. That was an ECW finish because it was Sabu and Rob Van Dam, where one guy would do the finisher and the other guy would steal his win, or the guy would set a guy up on a table and the other guy would jump off the jump off and run through the table, steal his victim. That's Paul Heyman mindset. That's why I don't know that he did that finish, but I think he when did. I watch that, I go, I, I I thought, yeah, I go, that's 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 that's, that's Paul Heyman. So that's why I thought he had some some input into that show. You think if um, Waller comes back, they'll still use Paul Heyman on SmackDown or something like that, or they'll just um, take him off TV? Mm, I think if Waller comes back, uh, that they would put him back on uh, on both shows. If they were to come to that agreement, they should. So, anything else? Um, guess that's a no. I guess that's a no. Okay, sort of Frank. Hello. Yes, Dave. Hey. How you doing? Great Hi. show, guys. Um, Thanks. Got a couple of stories and one question. Went okay. to the Royal Rumble this year at uh, Madison Square Garden. You know, great show. We were waiting outside afterwards to see whatever wrestlers come out. Earl Hebner walks out. My friend screams, you screwed Brett. He goes, yeah, and I made a lot of money, too. Yeah, well, he did. I, Have you ever heard of a referee in wrestling making a half a million dollars a year in contract? <laughs> that is like... He got well rewarded for that thing. Yeah, I just thought it was real interesting. Yeah, I, I tell you what, you know, um, and uh, you've probably seen some of these, Brian. I, you know, I I would have a lot more sympathy for Earl Hebner had I not read like v various newspaper stories of him trying to justify himself. Yeah. The more he has tried to justify himself, the less I respect him. You know, because it's like, you know, you know, so, you know, it's like, weren't you and Brett friends? Yeah, we were friends. And it's like, but Brett never offered me any money not to screw him. I'm thinking like. If you're well, friends, did you, uh, did you uh, talk to him about this to see if he made Well, remember, offer? remember, remember, yeah, he didn't tell him, but remember the other one was, I told him I wouldn't fast count him. I never counted fast. Yeah. It's like, what the hell is that? Why not just go, <laughs> look, I need to feed my family. I, I know, there's ways of saying it's like, look, I'd have lost my job, 
Um, I was put in a horrible position. I felt so bad about, you know, screwing my friend, and maybe I made the wrong choice, or maybe maybe I just, I had no choice. It was my job. But instead of saying, like, well, he didn't offer to pay me, you know, any money to protect him. So it's like, God, great friend. Yeah. I'll tell you what, though. If he wasn't if he wasn't his friend, it would be different. But, you know, what? if it was my friend and it was the same situation, it would it would really hurt. Yeah. You know, especially if... Because you got to remember, he went to him. God, we're talking about this subject again. He went to him the night before. I mean, if like a Brett had never even gone to him and had never thought of it, and it just happened, that's one thing. But when you go the night before and just go, you know, Earl, um, you know, I'm afraid that that this is going to happen. And he goes, "Don't worry, I swear on my kid's life," which is what he said. Because I talked to more than one person who was there when he said it. And you know, I will never, you know, I will never fast count you or whatever the exact words were. And then to do it, that's that's pretty bad. Yeah. You know? But anyway. Oh, sucks for his kids. <laughs> uh, I, I read uh, a lot of Sinister Minister's commentaries on Mikey Whipwreck's uh, website. Uh-huh. Uh, a lot of uh, Sinister Minister? Yeah. Jim yeah. Mitchell, yeah. And I came across a funny commentary I just thought I'd share with you. It was, uh, he talks about they're on a road trip, and it was him, Whipwreck, and uh, Tony Mamaluke, while Mamaluke was in WCW. And uh, he told Mamaluke he would be you would be meeting uh, a waitress named Brandy at his house, and he would deflower, she would deflower him. So uh, they bring him back to the house. He's all nervous and, and everything, and it turns out to be an inflatable love doll. So he comes out, and they start, you know, laying the smack down on her and putting uh, long neck beer bottles inside various holes within the doll. So Whipwreck does a key to in-leg drop. A bottle comes flying out and nails uh, Mama Luke right in the head. He suffered his concussion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as a result, WCW terminated him. <laughs> I just it's a good story. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a colorful story. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny. He, he has a lot of great commentaries on this. I like the addition of the, the concussion part. Was yeah. that? Well, it, 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 it had to have a concussion finish. Yes. <laughs> with, to, with Tony Mama Luke. Yeah. But um, I just thought I'd share that. And one more question here. The finish of the uh, deathmatch tournament. With uh, Cactus and Terry? Yeah. What, what was the deal with that? Because it looked like Terry kicked out as the ref counted three. I don't I don't know. Um, it, it may have been. you got to remember that, like, like Terry was a big-time superstar. Mm -hmm. And he really, for Terry Funk at that point in time, to put over Cactus Jack in Japan was a real big deal. And right. maybe maybe that was just, like, kind of like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put him over, but I'm going to kick out to, you know you know what I mean make it because look. just by putting him over enough gives him enough credibility but I'm trying to protect you know or make, or make it a little bit controversial you know yeah. I, I don't I don't I don't know Terry's Terry's a very clever man I mean he probably is he's, he's very he's had, he's had a lifetime in this business it's a long it's a long life but those were predetermined finishes oh, of course yeah all right yeah, yeah. all right thanks a lot guys good show uh, okay tons of emails here a couple phone calls as well from Phil Schneider who's a regular caller uh, mentions, uh, didn't you see Paul Heyman's fingerprints all over the Vince and Trish angle? It's classic ECW misogyny angle. Tommy Dreamer getting the baby face pop for pile driving Beulah. Believe me, that's exactly what I thought. I was, I was thinking that I saw the guy there and saw the commentary and thought that he probably did have a hand in some of it. But the fact is, is the thing they did the week before was before he got there. Although he's been talking to them for several weeks. Uh, let's see. Um, I thought you would find this in interesting. Um, at a Roz War in D.C., the security removed from fans several signs that referenced Jerry Lawler. A sign that said, we want the king was, was taken away, sitting right in front of us. There were also numerous banners that were taken down that referenced the cat and Jerry. Okay, now, that makes me think that it's not a work. Because yeah. it was a work. If it was a work, Plus, I would they just didn't steal confiscate the, the fans last night. What? Nothing. <laughs> okay, I got it. Uh, what was Vince doing knocking the politicians of D.C.? Where is he going with this? It, it makes no sense except to venting his own frustrations. Well, that's what he was doing. So that's it. Yeah, there's no, it doesn't, there's no more sense. Uh, let's see. Do you think Bret Hart's bitterness towards the industry taints his credibility in his book? I think it's still going to be the most honest book there. In fact, I think, I think that that will make it more honest because most of the guys who do books... Sugar-coated. Sugar-coated. Like Mick Foley, who is, who is an honest guy... I mean, and I, you know, Mick Foley will hold back on things that he thinks are damaging to the industry. And um, I know in his, in his upcoming book, um, I, t I talked to him about one of the chapters, which is he, he's addressing the drugs in his next in, in his next book in a chapter, 
And he told me um, ahead of time, he goes, you're not going to like the chapter. You know, and I know why, because he's, you know, he's going to address it, and then he's going to try to rationalize it, I suppose, mm-hmm. or, or, or point the finger somewhere else or something, you know. Um, but, you know, Bret Hart, has, because he has no one to protect, um, and I think, you know, um, I think that that will, if anything, it will uh, help the credibility of this book. I mean, just look at China's book. I mean, she didn't badmouth, well, what am I talking about? She, she badmouthed was very everyone. Very careful ex- who she badmouthed. She badmouthed everyone except for the people she worked with. Although she, yeah, you know, she, she, exactly. didn't bad, she, she sort of badmouthed Lawler. Yeah, she like but made him out to be like not very nasty. Fire, fire. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. She didn't knock. She didn't knock Vince. She didn't knock Jim Ross. She didn't praise Jim Ross, but she didn't knock him. Yeah. Uh, how much longer does Luger have under contract? Will WCW have the grapefruits to release him due to the business simply passing him by? I hope so. Because would Scott Steiner leave like Jerry Lawler did if Rick was let go? Possibility. Possibility. Uh, don't, don't know. Uh, let's see. Does this remind you of the build-up for WrestleMania 5? Austin is Randy Savage, The Rock is Hogan, Deborah is Elizabeth. Huh, never thought of it that way. Uh, let's see. This is from Jeff. Did they want to recreate Jim- the success of WrestleMania 5. It was a big money, it was a big money one, though. It's just a crummy show. Yeah. It was a big, big money show. It was, that was the biggest money show at that point in time that there ever was, so. You know, Jeff from California did a copy of the Observer ever yet uses a prop in a pay-per-view promo by Hogan from WCW <laughs> years back. Yes, it did. I recall Hogan either tearing up or burning it and saying, "Observe this in an angle." What was the reason? Um, he was just him Sting and Savage were just in a bad mood. I don't know what I wrote that week, but it was just, they they did do that. Um, during uh, this is Tony Schiavone from last night, during the Flair Rhodes Jarrett segment, he said, "Quote: If there's a bigger news story in wrestling right now, I don't know what it is." Uh, let's see. Despite the holding pattern in WWE, I noticed a lot of new things on Nitro last night. AJ Styles and Air Paris had new uniforms, a new video package, and new entrance music. Well, everyone's got videos and entrance music, so that's nothing new. And but they were new. Were still... They weren't. They... Kid Romeo had a video package and music. Well, everyone's got a video package and music. Okay. Kid Romeo having the. Uh, Stuff where they, uh, I mean, I like the way they introduced Kid Romeo. I thought they did a good job with him. Shane Helms had had a new ring outfit, new music, new video package, and dancers. Yep. I think the problem that with his letters, he's misunderstanding what we mean by the holding pattern. It's not yeah. like nothing can change. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. The backstage interviews have been shot in behind the music style. Have Okerlund and Pamela Paulshock been fired yet? Okerlund, no. Pamela Paulshock, yes. I think. Uh, the show started in the ring with no entrance, despite the fact it was the most horrible, god-awful, Ed Wood-esque thing I've ever seen on Nitro since Russo left. The Cat Canyon Hospital segment showed definite signs of experimentation. Hey, I, <laughs> Cornette, okay. Great. Okay. Great. This is, this is from Cornette last night. I don't want to hear about creative if it sucks, okay? The, uh, the object of pro wrestling is not to be creative. It's not to fool fans. It's to draw money, create... Creative stuff that confuses people does not draw money. Or angers sometimes, people. Yeah. Sometimes the most simple, straightforward, predictable angle um, draws the most money possible. Often. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. A reader emailed me and said she thought the Trish angle was a prelude to Trish suing Vince for sexual harassment eventually. And it's... Oh, forget it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, God, think about that, though. Think about how much fun Vince could have with it at an angle where he got sued. Yeah. And he got to run over lawyers with his... Oh, yeah. And destroy yeah, yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, this is from Toronto. TSN edited out the whole segment of Trish and, uh, and Vince. After a break, they showed uh, the very end in a... Re- they just showed Vince putting her jacket around her in a replay. Uh, okay, this is another person who said that. Uh, got another person who said that. Okay. Um... Wow, they only they did they did a four eight for the Vince Trish thing. That's well, it was less than they expected. That's all I can say. Okay, let's go to Chris. Chris, what's going on? Je- Hello. 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 Hey, this is Mark and Canada. How are you guys tonight? Oh, it's Mark. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, but I, I'll be Chris one of these days. Okay. But but um, a couple of things I wanted to make mention tonight. Um, first off, the thing you know, somebody had mentioned a call or two before about the uh the Brett Hebner thing back in 97. Um, everybody seems, the fact it seems to be lost in all the controversies, the fact that Brett, I mean, Vince approached Brett first and tell him that he intended to break the contract because he thought it was a bad deal. Well, good deal or bad deal, you made the deal, you live with it. 
Yes, that's true. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that have been forgotten in that story. The one that frustrates me the most that's been forgotten is, and this was because I was in, involved in this whole thing as it was going on, is that the Wednesday before that show, when Brett said that you know he wasn't going to lose in Canada, okay, Vince came to Brett. This was not Brett's idea. This was Vince's idea, and goes, "Let's swerve everyone." Not that I agree with this. Everyone knows that you're leaving, and everyone knows everyone thinks they know that you're losing. I want you to pin him right in the middle, and then you can lose the title, you know, on the next pay-per-view. Okay? I want you to pin Sean in the middle. Then he went to Sean, and Sean, and it wasn't Sean. It was Sean didn't know what to do. He called up Hunter, and Hunter told Sean, "Don't do it." And then Sean goes, "Why should I do a job for him?" Okay? And, and, and then when that word got back to Brett, obviously Brett was not going to do a job for Sean right. on that show. This, and this is Hunter with all his years in the business at that point, and all the money he had made. You Hunter's know, a smart guy, though. I mean, but Hunter's a smart guy. He understands business politics. I'm not gonna. Knock, I'm not gonna knock him because he plays the game well. But, no. but um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I know what you're saying, though. Yeah. Okay. Um, my second point. Okay. Um, guys, I would pretty much, you know, I, I know you guys have been in, you know, the journalistic end of the business for a while, but I would pretty much stake your reputations that the uh, lower business is not at work. It cannot be with, when he got when he got pulled off the XFL B game. It cannot be at work. He cannot involve NBC in that. I mean, if he had just pulled him off raw, fine. You could say all you want about it being a swerve, and maybe you could make a point. Well, the ratings are done. They may, Vince may try to take the company anyway, but it doesn't matter. They have NBC as a fiscal partner with financial records, with access to the stockholders and to the public. It absolutely could not be a work. The comments. Well, you, you know, you know, Ebersole wanted him off the XFL, though. Well, this is, this is a good point, but I mean, you know, if, it, if this turns out to be a work, I don't see how you can incorporate that. I, I just but not under. Why would it? Why would it cost? I mean, what would be the, the downside of taking them off of XFL? It's not well, going to cost them money or well, something like that. The downside is if they come back, they would have to play. They would have to acknowledge that it was some sort of angle, if it indeed it is an angle, and they would have to, you know, it basically that would give the wrong message to Vegas, give the wrong message to people who try to take the uh, product seriously. That there are going to be storyline scripted things involved in the league. Oh, 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 okay, okay, well, that, 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 that would. Ventura. That, yeah, then what about Ventura and Tillman? They were they were doing know, that. But now. you know what? You can make it. You can make a case. I mean, as bad as that is, you can make a case that that's just something they're just trying to play up in terms of a real life argument. Okay, Ventura criticizes his play call. It's Monday. It's Tuesday morning quarterbacking. At best. Right, okay, work. but then Ventura, Ventura has since gone public and basically said it's all an angle. Oh, I did not. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, it's, last week on C-SPAN, um, when when one of the reporters was going like. Um, was criticizing Ventura because Ventura is criticizing the press for always being negative and not, you know, and and then he goes, well, what about you on the XFL with Rusty Tillman? And he just goes, that's entertainment. I actually like the guy. Well, I'll tell you what, guys. Then, then that goes to one of two conclusions for that league: either the league's going to fold up at the end of the year, or there's not going to be another head coach or an assistant coach that comes over and takes a head job in that league. A. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think I think everyone. I think that like just the whole cheerleader thing is just Vince. This is. I think Vince is now. I think that whole thing is just, you know. Um, he's running out the string and he's just trying to it, 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 infuriate it, it, the media between now and the end of the season. Do you think Vince will just kind of fade out or do you think he's going to try and take it down in flames? It, it's a public embarrassment. Take it down in I, I, I don't know if you guys remember, but I made the, the comment last week about what they were doing to Tillman. It's become a public embarrassment for anybody involved in that league, from the coaches to the... Although, the only players, the only people that weren't affected in all this is the players because they're going to be evaluated on any sort of future with the NFL or the CFL by talent alone. They're the only ones who aren't affected. Everybody else is a public embarrassment. Um, it's real bad. I tell you, it's 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 what's real bad is for um, it's real bad for the people that the football people that Vince hired that went around and said you know that kind of like when this when before the season going like don't worry once the season starts it's going to be pure football. That's right, like Drew Pearson. Those, they're like going Drew to have Pearson, to bear, bury their heads Drew in the sands. Yeah, Drew Pearson because everything Drew Pearson said. I mean, he's he's he looks like a total fool now. No, exactly. I just you know you you can't feel anything but pity. For these people who gave Vince the benefit of the doubt as putting, you know, a product that would uh, rely basically on, you know, athletic ability and, you know, competitiveness of the teams, but now it's become a sideshow, is what it has five weeks in. You know what the funniest show. thing about the funniest thing about this is, and 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 again, you know, um, and and again, watching you know watching that thing last night also brought it to to my head, is that when it comes to predicting Vince McMahon's future actions, you know, I've been pretty decent at it. For the last 15 years, nobody's better at that than Mushnick, and people hate that. But <laughs> he, call, he called it before the season started. That's he called right. the whole. I'm sorry. 
Go, no, go ahead. No, Phil, Phil has been an excellent columnist for the last 20 years. I mean, I, I know he's only had his post gig for the last 15 or so, but he, he's been an excellent right on the money more times than not. I feel once in a while he may get a, may let a, let a little personal uh, vindictiveness get in, but overall his track record speaks for itself. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I agree. Sometimes he gets out of control. But, like, when it comes to, I mean, I just remember when he was on, you know, after the first week of the season, all the stuff that he said, you know, on, on, on um, what was it, on the uh, Jim Rome show. That's right. The last they, word. And then I, and I'm going, like, you know, he's right and those guys are wrong. But, uh, but but you know, it hadn't happened yet. And now here it is. And it was just, like, his prediction of, he, he predicted the ratings fall. And the, ra the reason for the ratings fall, when nobody else said what it was going to be, he predicted what Vince would do when the ratings fell. You know, when when all those football players were going, no, 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 I mean, absolutely not. You know, he would know. You know, this is going to be this going to be a league. You know, like uh, this is going to be a pure football league, and all that hype they did was just to get attention before the season started. No, well, that's exactly it. I mean, I mean, Fish Mushnick was right on the money. You got to give the guy his due. Right on the yeah. money, like him or hate him, and I happen to respect him very much. Like I said, a little bit of vindictiveness, vindictiveness from time to time, but basically right on the money. Um, yeah. I'll let you go on this one last question. Um, and, you know, I always like to throw in my tight uh, historical question. 1985, uh, when Bravo was Canadian heavyweight champion, uh, Tony was promoting a match in Toronto against Hogan, and then it fell apart six weeks before. What happened with that? Any idea? Yeah, okay, what it was, they were, they were promoting a Hogan-Bravo match. They sold out the uh, forum with it, and what happened was the agents, when they got there, they were afraid, this was, you know, in the early days, of the, they were afraid Hogan was going to get booed against Bravo, and they didn't want to put Hogan in that position, they switched the card. And Bravo was real upset about it. Oh, it's Cause I think Bravo for his own. I think Bravo for his own ego wanted to go in there and be cheered against Hogan, you know, be the, you know which which he may have been, and and they were, you know, that's why they switched it. But yeah, that's the story. And and that was, and then right after that, I, be, I get think of three or four months after that, Vince decided to phase out the Canadian heavyweight uh, title from the uh, from Tony's promotion that he basically took over. He phased that that out, right? No, nothing. Yeah, they, they kind of forgot about all that. Yeah, that's the same thing as like when they bought the Atlanta promotion and they recognized like Les Thornton as world junior heavyweight champion for a little while and they just forgot it. Well, and like spoiler is national champion. All right, guys, have a good one. Talk to you later. Thanks. Bye-bye now. Okay, thanks very much. All right, let's uh, get a couple of more of these. I'm not going to read any more emails about the Trish Stratus thing unless it's a dissenting viewpoint. We've got like tons of them and they're all pretty much saying the same thing now. Uh, let's see, I wanted to ask you since the name was brought up, who are the Ding Dongs? It was uh, Richard Sartain and Greg Evans. Uh, any chance Paul will do one final show at the ECW Arena with all the past and past stars? Who's going to finance it? Um, I, I don't want to say there's no chance, but I don't think so. Um, Plus, with guys going to WCW. Yeah, that's on. right. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, no way that if a show were run, they'd get everybody together. But, you know, they could get some of the guys that are just working indies and do, you know, just a show there. It's not going to be anything spectacular. He goes, I'm writing this is Sean Colton. He goes, I'm writing the fence on this one. There's no chance I'm letting my 10-year-old daughter watch the segment when she watches the show. On the other hand, it's the WF. I don't let her watch it first anyways. So I'm sorry. What do we expect was going to happen? Uh, let's see. It's from Ryan Chicago. A better question for the Cat Canyon skit would be, what on earth Ernest Miller was doing in a hospital room without a shirt on? The man wears a vest for every match, but we understand that his daily wear is to wear pants only. Maybe he was getting ready to do something. I want to know how Canyon managed to not only sneak into a room undetected, but also managed to procure a doctor's outfit, or that nurse's outfit, or whatever he was wearing, and uh, get a camera crew in there, and uh, <laughs> no intercom to alert the doctors that there was uh, a trauma in the room. Uh, that was quite that a was, skit. Yeah. Uh, let's see. This goes, I may be, this is from Chris, who goes, I may be... In yeah, minority here, I enjoyed the Trish Angle, not for sadistic reasons of seeing a girl beg and be degraded, and not just for TNA. There's something about Vince going off on his rants that makes me laugh. No, Vince, Vince is, is a humorous guy. It's just, you know, there's, there's too much of that weirdness of Vince that, that we sort of all know about that I, sometimes I don't want to deal with. Yeah. It's like there. There's, there's something. I'll tell you this, this story. Um, when... Okay, you remember a couple weeks ago on SmackDown when they did the skit where um, Trish was in the limo going like, oh, who's daddy's little girl and all that, and she was screaming really loud and, mm -hmm. and all that. Now, they did that skit, okay? Now, when they put it on the air, for a lot of reasons, there were people who got gun-shy on it, and they turned the sound down. I mean, apparently what, it, what went on the air was not nearly what Vince envisioned it, okay? And then Vince... Uh, when, when, you know, I mean, whoever it was, whether it was Kevin Dunn or whoever made that call, I don't know. But Vince went to Lawler, and he was all proud of that segment. And he just goes to Lawler and just goes, you know, a lot of people probably aren't going to like this, 
But me and you, we're cut from the same cloth. And 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 and, and you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you'll you'll appreciate this. That was, that was very interesting. Yeah. Anyway, I gotta make one I, comment, by the way. The yes. whole thing we were talking about earlier, I made the comment that all these people couldn't get a girl, and your comment was, No, these are all people that have been snubbed by a girl. I no, don't not all disagree. Of them. Because okay. Okay. you ahead. and I both have been snubbed by a girl and I didn't enjoy that. I thought it was hideous. Okay. You're right. I, I think there were a lot of messed up guys in that crowd. I will not take that back. Well, that is, but that's that's the ECW. You know, I mean, that's that's the ECW arena thing. Yeah. I remember the first time I went to ECW. I mean, like when you, when you you beat up a girl or you you know, I mean, that that's the biggest pop you can get. Yeah. And they did it over and over and over. <laughs> Forever. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's from Brad who goes. It's not hard to figure out why there was not a ratings boost for the Trish Vince angle. It wasn't sexy. Nobody wants to see Trish naked more than me, but it was horrible. My stomach turned. When Paul Heyman said that this was Vince raping Trisha for dignity, it wasn't far from the truth. It had the feel of watching a rape scene in a movie, not the playful puppies type mood the WF has presented in the past. Interesting. You know what? I'm going to put my foot in my mouth. I was just thinking about this during the break. I once, many years ago, had a breakup. I mean, you're talking about being snubbed by a woman, right? And I actually, and I never wanted to do what Vince did last night. But I will say that I did, in my fantasies, envision the thing from the week before. <laughs> I didn't do it. I ended up, um, what did I do? I, I smashed a banana. Was it a banana in her hair? Banana in her hair. Yeah, that was the famous banana in the hair s scene. So anyway. I was wondering, because there was a comment in the Observer last week, where you said okay. something like, I can't remember what it was, something like this wasn't as messy as some of my breakups. Or something oh, I, along those lines, and I thought. Oh, I was just saying that as a joke. <laughs> but uh, I thought there might have been a story. No, no, there, there, there was actually no hidden, hidden meaning to that comment because I hadn't even thought of that at the time. But, but I did think of, um, oh my god, oh my god. All the memories are coming back now. No. Do you know who knows the whole detailed story of the banana in the hair story? Is the, is the only person Jim who knows it. No, Jim Cornette doesn't. Paul Heyman. Uh oh. I talked. I, I talked to him later that night. Went through the whole story blow by blow. <laughs> He's booking WWF. Oh my God! If there would have been a banana last week, that would have been proof. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, this is from someone who goes. I'm a pretty strong guy. You were eating I, bananas when this broke up occurred. Or this breakup? No. Do you want? Do you want? Okay. We're going to talk about my breakup now instead of wrestling. We right, I'll tell you the story. story. Okay, this is 1991, and and it was the night. And I'll tell you. Okay, this was this was the night that Hulk Hogan lied on the Arsenio Hall show. Okay, okay. all right. And I, I had just written an article for Sports Illustrated, and I was like exhausted, so I fell asleep. And my girlfriend at the time left, and then she came back, and she was drunk. She was out with some friends, and she was drunk. Okay, and we got into a and 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 she walked in right as Hulk Hogan was lying on the Arsenio Hall show, and he goes. You know, like, have you ever done steroids? And he goes, well, three times in my life to rehabilitate a torn bicep. You know the why? And she looked at, the, I remember, she looked at the thing and goes, oh, my God, he's lying. He's killing his career. And I go, yep. <laughs> so, anyway, we got into a big fight a few minutes after that. That's how I re uh, and And she smashed a banana in my face and just was laughing hysterically because she was drunk. So, this is, um, so, so about a couple weeks later, we had the breakup. And so, I actually, like, felt that, that as far as the breakup goes. You had to complete the angle. I had no. I, I was I was owed my retribution, <laughs> and like I was I was like not going to uh, like if I was never going to see this person again, I did in fact have to do something with a banana, and that was the, that was the spot. Okay, but as far as so anyway. Wow. Uh, yeah. That's a hell of a story. Is it really? It you is. Yeah. You know what else? Um. Not all that I many weeks. It, I just I'm just thinking it's funny because I look at it from the whole wrestling standpoint. Where you built up the spot with the banana, the second spot, <laughs> by an incident that occurred a couple of weeks earlier. That's, <laughs> it's the story of my life, is all wrestling angles. But anyway, I had long since forgotten that whole banana story. I mean, not forgotten it, but I hadn't thought of it. And years and years later, I was in a phone conversation with Paul Heyman, and we were talking about this, this actually the same person. And he goes, Remember when you put the banana, the, the banana with her hair? You know, and she, oh, by the way, just to, to make the story worse, she just got it permed earlier that day. So she can't, she couldn't wash it for several days, theoretically. Uh, 
So which which was what made it really mean. But anyway, so he he brought that. You know, years later when I had completely forgotten about it, um, he had um, he still remembered that story. Very interesting. Anyway, where was I? Let's go to Chris. I just buried myself pretty good there. Hi, uh, Chris, what's up? It's going pretty good. I just want to give a quick hello to Chaz in the ObserverLiveChat dot com in the chat room. And uh, cool. okay. Um, about the Trish thing, um, the one thing about that, though, you guys have been saying how guys that have been snubbed might like that. In the angle itself, though, Vince wasn't snubbed by Trish, really. I mean, he, if anything, snubbed her from the start, and then she just came crawling back. It wasn't oh, like no, 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 this wasn't the same. That would never happen. Yeah, no, 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 you're not, you're not. I mean, that's why Hunter and Stephanie are still married, because neither of them will ever let the other one get, <laughs> neither one will ever let themselves get dumped. That's true. But um, I, I that's think that's what killed the the, the, the uh, Kurt Angle angle because the whole logic of that angle is is that she dumps Hunter for Kurt Angle and then it never happened and it was just like well what was that all about for the last year? Because he wouldn't make himself look that bad. Yeah. God. Um, he was kind of in a in a troublesome situation because half of him wanted to make Kurt Angle a total geek. Actually, probably all of him. And you can't lose your girl to a geek. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um, but it's, okay, so now I hate to keep harping on this angle, but I have sort of a different view than you guys do, so at least it won't be much of the same. Um, the, the fact that, um, I, I sent you that email that you just read about how I was kind of in the minority. The fact that, um, everybody was cheering for that, I don't know that it necessarily means that they were all, like, kind of messed up, that they popped for the certain things. I think they knew enough to know that it was like, you know, they know enough of knowing what is real, what isn't real, and I think, if anything, it was just guys being guys as far as every time he said, take your shirt off, take this off, do this, do that. I mean, a sexual reference, they popped for it. I don't think it was just that she was degraded, because I think if they had degraded her maybe where there was none of the sexual stuff involved, they may I mean, not have been. Barking like a way. dog wasn't a sexual thing. I mean, the, the well, taking he the made clothes a off. To, I've seen you on all fours before, and then well, they kind of popped for pop. that. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, say, if somebody was doing that to Stephanie, but there was nothing sexual involved, you know, when she's got a you know, her baby face kind of thing going, I think there would be more sympathy for her, and I think there would have been for Trish if they didn't include the sexual aspect of it. I mean, that's just... Well, they, they, they gave you no reason to have sympathy for Trish when she came in and wimped out. Right, right, that's true, too. But, I mean, if they had just, if he just sort of, if they just wanted to play up the evil McMahon thing, like, I mean, for the whole thing, he was a face because he was getting popped every time to take his shirt off, let me see what color panties you got on, and all that stuff. They loved him for that. And then, you know, of course, when he says, put your coat on, and we're not going to get to see your chest, you know, then everybody boos him. But... I, I just think it was more for the, just the sexual aspect, just the, the TNA part that they pop for, and not so much that okay, we just love to see women get degraded here. And it wasn't like it was just uh, you know him berating her and making her cry where they were trying to get. Yeah, you know, he knew he knew he was going to get the face heat on that. I think just because of the, like I said, the just for the sexual part. So I don't think he went into that saying from the beginning. Well, I'm just going to become an even bigger heel here by you know picking on this poor girl. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know, it's just, and that, that lawsuit idea, I think, is actually not that bad of an idea, and it sort of points more to Heyman again, because he's done that before. Plus, Vince I just could... filed a lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> I could, um... Really, he did. Could... This is perfect. Yeah. I could see, um... I could see a work sexual harassment lawsuit coming out of that. And yeah, because, like I said, I mean, if Heyman is having any influence on the stories, I mean, he, uh... He sure, has plus, plus... Plus, Vince has the frustration with that uh, Sable and Nicole Bass lawsuits out there. Right, that's it. And I was thinking the same thing, too, when I was watching the whole thing about uh, how anybody that's ever come back to him for a job that's left the WWF, how, uh, you know, how I wouldn't be too surprised if he was saying similar things to them in the office, you know, just to uh, berate them to show them how much he could uh, get out of them. Because I kind of thought that... I mean, think of the they, whole psychology of that. I mean, the whole thing could be, maybe it turns out... Um, I don't know, they catch her doing a phone call with somebody else saying, I just want to get some money out of him, or, you know, whatever, yeah. and then he gets to... Well, remember, what was, the, what was the girl's name they did that thing with, um, that they dumped, that they ended up dumping before going anywhere with the storyline? Um, remember the bodybuilder girl with, um, Chaz Warrington? Oh, oh. um... Mrs. God, Cleavage. I forgot her name. Uh, yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Cleavage. I don't remember what I mean, she was Beaver, Beaver, Beaver Cleavage, or Mrs. Cleavage, and then she... Like... Uh, I forget her name. She was a woman bodybuilder, but anyway... It doesn't really matter, but they, you know, that was like, remember, like the, the fake, be the fake beating and all that. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I, I thought too. Uh, there were things about it that it seems like, especially the way uh, Stephanie treated her afterwards about going, telling her to go get the coffee. I was sort of was thinking back Which to the. Which she never got, I might add. <laughs> yeah. Well, we never saw her come back from the the store, but the uh, the old Virgil DiBiase thing. 
I sort of was thinking of that where maybe oh oh oh, oh I saw that the beginning was the Teddy Biasi and then the, the yeah. coffee was the coffee reminded me of every wrestling angle where there would be someone who would mistreat someone yeah. for so long. And, I mean, those angles actually work really good because the people just want them to turn so bad. Exactly. That's what, I'm, that's but, what I was but thinking. The, but the, the thing with Trish that's going to make it difficult was is that, you know, they're usually simple people who are manipulated as opposed to Trish who, like, you know, like, like there's some contract that they can't get out of or they're going to foreclose on the parent's house or some weird dominance Buy thing the that they can't get out Yeah, in yeah, <laughs> the WoW pay-per-view. But, but this one, I mean... By her coming back and begging, it's like, how much of a baby face can she be? We have no respect for her now. She, you know, no one has respect for people that don't stand up for themselves after they've right. been wronged. So. Well, I mean, I, there might be a way around that. I think, if anything, in time, if anything, that part of it may even become forgotten somewhat. And well, if they need to turn her, it will. If they, if they yeah. decide to turn her, I just think, I just sort of got the impression that they were building this all so that she'll eventually break away and gain some self-respect and finally tell the McMahons the whole evil family or whatever, or... You know, just side maybe with Linda when she comes back as a baby. Something like that. You know what I mean? Just to get her on the opposite side of the McMahon's. Because I was surprised because I was at that, I was at the Springfield House show on a Saturday and she came out and she got this big reaction as a face and she was doing a whole promo about I don't need the McMahon's and this and that. And the more everybody cheered her, then she goes, and I don't need your cheers and everybody started booing her. And I found it surprising because this was obviously before this angle took place that, uh, I guess they were testing to see if they could still keep her as a heel because um, they just had to completely do a turnaround, and then she attacked, she cost Lita her match with Ivory uh, later, you know, on, during that show, uh, cost her a shot at the title. So I guess it's obviously been a plan, and they just wanted to see how they'd react to her as a, as a heel. Um, also, Regal at that show, even at the house shows, he was incredible. He cut the, the funniest promo before his match with Blackman, and then during the match with Blackman, Blackman beat him up the first 30 seconds or so of the match, threw him around the ring. He got up, he grabbed the mic, and he put his hand out, he goes, I believe we've gotten off to a bit of a rough start here, and he tried to make up with him. It was just—he's just incredible. That guy's just too funny. He—he—he he, he may be my favorite character on that show. Yeah, I, I, yeah. To it. And I thought Christian was was really funny too last night on the phone with a uh, Edge. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah what do you call, what'd you call that girl? Hose bag or the something? Hose bag. Yeah. And then he <laughs> high fives the phone and. Uh, just... <laughs> he high fives the phone. <laughs> I just thought that was. Weird. I just loved when Al, when Al Snow came in, Steve Regal with the midgets. The midgets. Oh jeez. <laughs> That was that was. Funny. Amy Camelos, Camelos. Does that um, familiar? Uh, Camelos was definitely her last name, but I don't. Remember, I don't think her first name was Amy. Um. But but Camelos, yeah, that was her last name. Mar 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 Mariana. Mariana, yeah, was it? Yeah. Mariana, Mariana right? Yeah. Yeah, Mariana Camelos, and she was her her ring name was just Mariana, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Let's see. Well, last thing was that that whole cat segment. I was thinking the same thing. Why the hell he was walking around the hospital with no shirt on to do the running? <laughs> that was the last thing I was thinking. Is the funny but, part for some reason that popped. But you know what the funniest first. part was? It, it was it's the first time before they were in the hospital when they got the limo. Tony Schiavone goes, "There's a limo pulling up to the building," and you see a limo pulling up to the building, and then they go inside the limo, and Sean Stasiak's telling them that we're at the hospital. We're not at the <laughs> arena. <laughs> I didn't yep. even catch that. I missed that part. Yeah, watch that back. It was so. It was so bad. And also, too, I don't know if you caught this, just, uh, while Canyon and Cat were fighting throughout the whole thing, Miss Jones is yelling for a nurse. She's oh, yelling, nurse, nurse, fight. nurse, as if the nurse was going to run in and, and break up well, the whole Well, I'm just, I'm just thinking, like, they're doing all this stuff for for minutes, and you're in the hospital. I'm thinking, like, that's, well, I guess there's, there's that no explanation. That went so long. I mean, just so yeah, wait. horribly long. Well, they had to get all of their little jokes, and they had to get every single, you know, of those things that they did in the Vince McMahon skit with Steve Austin in, in one segment. It, it was kind of like a, a, a WOW uh, segment, but it, at least if you're watching WOW, you kind of laugh because it's so so bad. But here they're actually trying to get it across as serious, so it's like part of you wants to cry when you see it. It's just that bad. It's like it's just a pathetic attempt to, uh, like you know, I guess get that whole McMahon angle from the hospital that the WWF had. It's just pretty pretty sad, and uh, I don't know. They, they're not. They need if Bischoff does anything, he's got to bring in people that know how to produce angles like that backstage because that's something WCW's never been good at. Even when you know when Russo was trying to do that. They just, they had no idea how to execute Or just someone that'll go, that is not funny. Exactly. Yeah, but once yeah. it's already, once it's, you know, you never really know. You can have an idea on paper that's good, and if the acting's bad or something, or it's too, you know what I mean? <clears throat> yeah. yeah. You, you know, the problem is, is, you know, maybe they make too much of an attempt at humor and, like, miss too often. But then again, you got to have, you got to have some lightness in the wrestling show, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, uh, I was also going to say, uh, we were thinking maybe we could put uh, Austin slightly ahead of Triple H as the smartest man in wrestling at this point for getting his wife involved in 
Well, we don't know companies. that, but you may, you, like I said, you may very well be right. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't give him points for being smart for that, though. That's going to kill his character. I, I was thinking the same thing. Austin, yeah, it's weird. You know, nobody wants to see Austin white. married, let alone, you know, no, yeah, no one wants to see Austin married. And you know what? They, you know, as, as, as attractive as she is for her age, and, you know, she's probably 41 years old. Yeah. Or uh, 40. Um, or, you know, I th see, she would be 41 this year. So, as, I, I, I think that guys, I don't know how to say this, but young guys, well, I don't know, she is, she's an attractive woman, but I think that they want the idea that Steve Austin would be with, like, young girls and not, uh -huh. and certainly, no, let's make this, they would not want Steve Austin married. It doesn't fit in that character. It doesn't fit his character at all. Plus, the whole thing right. with him being married, and they have that, that uh, skit last night in the locker room where they showed less electricity than any married couple I've ever seen. Yeah, ever it was weird, life. yeah. It and just I seemed thought, like they were just kind of oh, there. And hideous. No connection or anything. It seemed like they weren't really married, and they were actually acting like they were married. When Hi, Steve. Hi. <laughs> 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 Yeah, they can never yeah. do it. Well, you know, she, she, is, she is a pretty bad actress. She is a horrible actress. Yeah. That's why I think it's even worse. You know, I, I was worried so long that Triple H was going to sneak his way into the main event, but, you know, it doesn't look so bad now that we're going to have to listen to her. <laughs> maybe Triple saying. H maybe Triple H can be handcuffed to her. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, Chris, we got to get running. Okay? All right, thanks a lot. Okay, let's go to Mitch. Mitch, what's up? Hey. Mitch. I just want to say that although the Trish angle disturbed me, any, as long as that thing somehow can keep elevating Regal with McMahon, I'm okay with it. There's better ways to do that. I think so too, but I don't, you know, um, if that's as good as they're gonna do, as, as opposed to him just being a, you know, a mid carter and, and, you know, garbage matches and stuff, which is a total waste, I'd rather see, you know, whatever it takes to get him in there. He needs to be in a sitcom. He's too good for wrestling. He's just unbelievable. I know. He's just, I mean, he's so good. He's and, another uh, one you know, that as WCW had stuff, for all those I... years, and they didn't, and they didn't figure it. Uh, you know what? I, <laughs> WCW had him and Steve Austin, yeah, and Mick Foley. God, and they're so good. They're, they're all hilarious. hilarious. Well, yeah, I don't know if Austin's hilarious, but he certainly can draw money. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, he's to me, he's hilarious in a, in a different no, Re kind of way. I mean, and, Regal and Mick Foley are hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I, you know what, I just wanted to say that I, too, like the last caller, was kind of like, oh, no, please, not a three-way, you know, WrestleMania with, you know, not that I have a problem with Helmsley being in the main event. I love Helmsley, but I just, I'm so sick of the three- and four-way gimmick. It's just, it's, I'm just so done with it. Uh, other than the Armageddon cage match, I thought that they worked, you know, a bunch of guys in there actually really well. Um, but, you know, this Deborah thing is, is awful. And uh, I don't know. I'm just disappointed. I, I when I watched it last night, I've been trying to think how are they going to build a two baby face WrestleMania? Are they going to do you know like someone that wrote in? I guess are they going to do the Hogan you know uh, Savage Elizabeth thing, or are they going to do the Savage Ultimate Warrior thing, or the you know where you think one of them's going heel and one of them's not, and you know maybe you have Mr. McMahon kind of side with one of them, and you know the way that they're going with it, I think is the worst possible scenario. You know, this is one of those matches that you don't need to get complicated and you don't need to get cute because exactly. the match itself sells. And yeah. and that's why that's why I think I was so disappointed with the Deborah thing because it's sort of like, you know, if it was an, you know, and I don't, I don't, the idea of the guy's wife being the other person's manager, I think, you know, in the right situation, that's a pretty cool angle. Mm -hmm. But my feeling was, it's like, this is the first time they've met, maybe for the rematch, but we don't need anything. Just, you know, give the people, you know, the people have been waiting all year for this match. So give them this match without the cuteness, and then you know if after they've done the match the first time and the, the novelty's off, you know then then have Deborah come in after WrestleMania. And, it's and just like that. Cornette said, you know, just build the program just straight for that. I would almost rather have that just be totally traditional, you know, and then you can do all the wild angles with all the other matches on the card. Yeah. And speaking of, how, where do you think Angle and Triple H are going to fall into it? Do you think that they'll they'll rekindle and try and finish off the feud from the summer, you know, at WrestleMania, just to give those guys a spot, or what do you what do you think they're going to do with them? I mean, I heard that the the celebrity rumors with Triple H, but I mean, if there's not when you look at it on paper and you see where everyone's kind of lining up, I see Triple H and Angle kind of like lining up against each other, just because mm -hmm. you know they're the top two guys. You know, the, Maybe you they know, I don't know where... eventually do like a double break up, like they had the matches past Monday, you know, Triple H turns on Angle or something like that, or the other way around. And Rock I and thought at the end they were going to all end up brawling their teammates, personally. I, I, mean, I, I actually did, I, I actually did too, but you know what, I like the fact that they didn't do the Austin Rock thing yet, because everyone knows it's coming. Right. And I think that, that 
that, you know, and, and eventually they're going to do it. Now, if they go in there and then to the last week they never do the angle, then I'll go like, no, that's pretty dumb. But, <laughs> but yeah. everyone, you know, they, you know, they've still got several weeks to do it. They, you know, they got, you know, they got till April first. So, I still think, I mean, for me in watching wrestling, you know, maybe even in the last two years, that even though the, the Triple H, you know, Austin Cage match was great, and and even though their whole feud has been very good, that night in San Jose after the angle match, when they were face to face in the ring together. I mean, I, I I haven't marked out that hard, you know. I don't know since I don't know when. I mean, that I don't even know that you could build up that kind of energy with The Rock and Austin. I do. Uh, well, I don't know that you could on an on a dual babyface level without you know without that there, hatred with trying to keep both of them babyface. I, I think it's this is the one you could. We were totally out of time. Okay. Sorry about that. No, 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 no problem, Mitch. Um, okay. Anyway, we will be back. Um, we'll be back live Friday or Thursday at five.